All right, I'd like to call the Monday, June 5th uh, Council Subcommittee meeting to order. Roll call shows that all councilors are present. Uh, we have two subcommittee um, points on our agenda. Environment Committee followed by Community Development. And our first up is Environment Committee with Councilor Berthelsen. Okay, great. Um, as my first act as new chair of the Environment Committee, it's my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome some colleagues from the Bangor Area Comprehensive Transportation System, or BACS, to give a brief presentation um, about updates to the BACS committee work, which I have not yet been involved in. And so I'm really looking forward to getting up to speed with my fellow counselors. Welcome. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Um, my name is Maddie Jensen, and I'm a planner with BACS. And this is Sarah Devil, an executive director of BACS. And also on Zoom, hopefully, is Sarah Sadun, who's a um, consultant with Linnaean Solutions. She's one of the consultants on the project. She so should Sarah is not yet online. She's not yet online. Okay, great. Um, so if you have the presentation or if you've already sent it to me, I can go ahead and pop it up there. I'm just not sure if it's been shared with me already. I can start going through it off of memory because I don't need visuals for the first part of it. And then hopefully she joins. Um, so if you just want to let me know when she joins, that would yeah. be really helpful. And able to stay kind of more focused if we flipped and did community development first and had the discussion about the election for her to be here, or is it? Sure, it, that's, it, yeah, that yeah, works for us. And call her and find out where she is. <laughs> That's great. Well, let's. Does let's, somebody need to take our seats? No, you're fine. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> let's switch gears a little bit. Turn it over to Councilor DeMarit. Good evening. Um, happy to convene this meeting of the Community Development Committee to talk about um, procedure and timelines for holding our special election, election to fill a council vacancy. Um, I don't have to read this, do I? Sophia, do no, you want to walk us through it? Um, that, so I provided background. Do you want me to very quickly summarize it for people who haven't had a chance to read it? Um, not here, of course, but out in sure. the public. We've all read it. So um, on um, Monday night, one of the orders of business for council will be to accept a resignation from Councillor Cheryl Robertson. Um, her term was scheduled to end March 2024. So um, there are just a few months left in that term. As I um, chatted with council in the past, I needed some guidance on what some of the expectations were in the charter. Um, the, uh, the charter says you have to call, you must call an election if the resignation is more than six months before the annual town, um, town election. Annual, we would call that the annual election. Um, if it is less than six months, then it is optional for council. Uh, so I reached out first to Maine Municipal Association to try to get some free legal advice about what calling the election was. And when we were brainstorming, we were thinking all you had to do was set a date within 60 days, like say within 60 days, what the date would be. And um, they uh, they were kind of following that type of argument. But then when they went um, and had an internal discussion about it, based on principles, the way the ordinances or the charter is written and case law, they believe that it um, has, the election has to happen within 60 days. So they also said, but reach out to your town attorney because they don't provide specific legal advice. Mm -hmm. So I reached out to Roger Huber uh, who would be our attorney for this type of matter. And Roger um, advised, went back and did all the same kind of research they did and advised that he believed we needed to, you needed to accept the resignation at the next reasonable time, which would be Monday night, mm -hmm. and that you needed to hold the election within 60 days. Um, we had a discussion at that point about um, the abbreviated nomination process that's allowed under statute, which could actually shrink that to a 14-day window 
except there is some conflict with Title 30A, so we think it shrinks it to a 40-day window as opposed to a 14-day window. Did I say 40 twice? Nope. Yeah. yeah. 14 14 versus 40. Back, back first back. one was, four, was a, I'm sorry, a 24-day period. The other one is a 40-day period. So we believe that the minimum is a 40-day period. So that's the minimum nomination period is 10 days. The election has to happen under Title 21A. The election has to happen no less, uh, yeah, no less than 14 days after the close of the nomination period. When we look at um, Title 30A, all elections are required to have a 30 day, minimum 30 day absentee balloting process. So, so it changes it to a 40 day window. So I sent you a chart that is um, probably confusing if you don't have the narrative behind it, because there are some choices that council needs to make. So the first choice is when you wanna hold the election. And normally we work backwards to establish absentee balloting dates, nomination dates, all of that. Um, but working backwards from um, August 11th, um, there is a way that we could, the, the soonest we could hold the election would be um, June 27th. Is the soon, June sorry, Ju July 27th. <laughs> July 27th, I was looking at the one. Is the minimum, mm -hmm. yeah, the minimum period is July 27th. Um, and there is a way to get to, um, I think it was August 10th, um, that I outlined in the in yes. the background material. I do um, want to say that while it's absolutely within you, you know you're on extreme, extremely solid ground to have the election before August 11th. Um, there's probably some argument if you stretched it a little bit beyond that, but not much. So. Um, the thing that I need to understand is kind of when, how long do you want the nomination period? That really becomes the question that everything else then flows from. Um, if I think we would then want to talk about, is there promotion beyond postcards or mini observer, um, outreach, general outreach, and then whether or not you want to have a candidate night and when you'd want to do that, because normally there's a 10-day window between the end of nomination and the beginning of absentee balloting. We might want to just do hand count ballots, which would not provide a 10-day window, so we'd have to kind of think about how, how you want that timeline. Does that make sense? Thank you. Are there any questions or any questions for Sophie about the more general principles? G general principle question. Can this is mostly interpretation of our charter and it's in case law or in there and whatnot. I mean, theoretically, I probably we can't do a charter change quick enough. Sure, but could we going forward? And the, the only reason I'm asking is because of this of this particular situation where her term is up in the March 24. Can we look at changing the charter for when this happens and someone's going to have to run? I think you were going to check on at some point on whether this term that they run for could be 3.6 or something like that. No, the term is three years. It's spoken to in the charter. The it is it the we have to only fill it to the end of her term. There's no way around that one. No. Nope. So I guess my Again, it's back to my question is in that in this scenario, can we change the charter, whether it's probably going to have to be after to allow us to elect one the way we do for the RSU in the situation where the where someone's going to run for a six month term? I just think this is such a lot of work for it's it's too much work for the town to do this for six months, and it's a lot of work for someone to run for a position for six months. And it's a bad setup all the way around. So I don't know is my answer to the, can you appoint? I know that in 
that is the case in some communities, I would have to reach out and find out how totally doable. In terms of when we can change a charter, there is a very clear timeline for that. Longer than it's going to take us. Yeah, and you can only change it by referendum vote at an annual oh, municipal okay. election. Right. So and so we'd have to back it up. And I would also have to see, I don't believe that that is a major change. So there are minor changes, major changes, amendments and revisions. Um, as long as you stay in the minor world, you don't have to impanel a charter commission but if you step outside that you do um and i don't know whether giving council the power to appoint an, an elected official is stepping outside of the current model so i'd have to talk with roger about that yes my i one thing i'd respond to is can at night i i would I would say that that would not be necessary again for a six month position. I think that's a lot of extra, extra effort, um, and it, because someone's going to have to go through that in six months if they choose to rerun. I think it's put. I think it's putting a lot on staff to try. It. It's already going to be putting a lot on staff. Is yeah. my feeling. So adding that to it is that much more. So that would be. Feedback on that. Is there another venue that we could either at a council meeting or some other committee meeting have a have something where I mean I, I think it's valuable. I find it valuable to be able to share the, the video of you know, our council night. I would be concerned about marrying yeah. town business meeting with even a committee with um, election which is why we normally pull it aside and why the seated council normally doesn't participate <clears throat> as like the moderator or anything like that. Um, but uh, there wouldn't be a reason why we couldn't still put up the candidate information, offer the bios and ask them or invite them to do like the Zoom video that you, yeah, they could do that. I mean, yeah. I would nice say, yeah, to have those all on the website. And maybe we take questions that we, perennially get from candidates night and ask them to answer those. Now, just because I give an opportunity doesn't mean somebody does it. And right. so we want to think that through. Yep. It's a lot of it's short notice for now. It's good for the voter though too. Yeah. Yeah. Five, 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 research. Sarah? Um, I just want to be sure, Sophie, I got all my dates right. So if we did the shortest timeline possible, the nomination period is only 10 days and the earliest the election could be is July 27th. Yes. And if we did the longest timeline possible, the nomination period could be 27 days and the election would be August 10th. Is that correct? I think that's what I put in your background. I think so too, but I just yep. wanted to verify. So I'm just going to say up front that I'm personally in favor of the longest nomination period possible because I feel like it's going to be hard for this information to even get out to most of the community. Um, people don't expect an election this time of year. So I'm personally just going to put it out. I think I'd go for the longest nomination possible. That's all I've got. I was thinking along similar lines. And I also think people are, um, you know, we kind of expect elections to be on Tuesdays habitually. And so I was wondering about August 8th as kind of a sweet spot pushing toward the end of the window, but a Tuesday. Um, how would that feel from a staffing perspective or? I think that's fine. I think that um, we have to back up so that mm -hmm. will cut into yeah. the 27 the 27 days I guess I wonder what others think I think the Tuesday idea is a great yeah. idea yeah. I wonder if um, we could talk about whether we need a, a machine ballot or a hand ballot does the machine ballot mean we have to have even less nominating days? Is that what you told me? That's why. Yeah. So we normally would not offer up a hand count for mm -hmm. something that might draw a um, number of people. Yeah. The elections have been drawing more people. Yeah. Um, but talking with Bell, uh, the um, additional effort and risks we just have to slow down. Um, we feel would be really balanced um, against being able to have more nomination days. So 
um, the coding. So when I say we send it to print, it's not so it's pretty. It's because there are barcodes on the side of it that we can't reproduce. Um, so I would, from a staff perspective, you know, you, this is your election to yeah. organize. But I would say um, if we thought we were going to get even 600 um, people, we've got systems in place. It just means you won't know five minutes after the election. Sounds fine to me. Yeah. See why we need to go get the extractor to the machines if staff doesn't think we need to. So is that do we get the sense that there's a no we have to we have to formally vote on this at the 12th? So all you're voting on on the 12th is the you're setting the date of the election. From that, I take your feedback and staff runs the election. Okay. So when you set the date of this, we're going to go back 30 days, give us one day to print ballots, mm -hmm. then go back until the most reasonable date that we can have okay. uh, things open. So are you hearing, I feel like there's consensus for August 8th? Does that feel like it's people are comfortable with that? And yeah. do we want um, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. or do you want to? knock that down to 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. We're not seeing as many people come through in the late or even 7 to 7, um, which will give a little bit more time to. You can set any hours on a municipal election that you want. And we typically do 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. We typically do 7 to 8. I guess I'm feeling like with everything else being so weird and different, I'd rather keep as many things the same as we can for people's like you know, <clears throat> not getting even more confused, but that's just me. Does anyone else feel? I don't want Dave chased after coming early. So <laughs> he goes, he'll ask there, he'll be here any minute. And sure enough, he was here. All right. I feel comfortable keeping it um, as usual. Okay. And we can keep monitoring. If, if nobody comes in for the last two hours, and that's then a trend you've been the noticing. Next, then we'll know. Then we'll know. So, and we can think about it going forward. Yep. I think that sounds good. Sophie, can you back those dates up for us just so I know we don't need to decide them, but the August 8th election puts so us the at a... August 8th election, and I'm going to have to count it out, but should put you right around um, um, absentee. So part of the reason I picked the way we picked, um, what if we did... So the problem is I can't have a period end on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. That like right. a nomination yeah. period or. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when you go to the eighth, that means I have to back up the start of absentee ballots to the 6th of July, which means that your absentee period. So we could write, we could close the nomination process on the 5th and it opens on the 13th of June. So gives you about 21 days of nomination. So that's why- Nomination's July 5th. Yeah. And July 5th. July 5th, yeah. They, Absentee ballots would be available starting with six because we're just going to hand print them. Mm -hmm. And then we will um, have the election on the 8th. What days of the week are the 5th and the 6th of July? The 5th and the 6th of July. 5th is Wednesday. 6th is Thursday. And neither of them are holiday days this year then. Mm -hmm. okay. Got it. Thank yeah. you. And yeah. So that's, and so my plan would be, if I'm relatively sure you're not going to change the dates, we can get the postcards ready to go so we can drop them on the 13th to let people know there's a nominating process and how to do that and when the election is. We would do that to all current residents, so not taxpayers, but residents, uh, not the voter list, everybody. Um, and then we would do 
normal outreach, social media, website, and sign. Media will pick it up because they're on our outreach list. Who knows what they'll do with it? Well, I think the material you put together for this meeting was very helpful and uh, extensive, so thank you for that. And does anyone else have any questions or concerns for the Community Development Committee? Thanks for putting yes. this together so quickly. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Anya. We are back to backs. Wonderful. Um, friends from Vax, are you are you ready to chat with us about public transit? Yeah. So thanks for giving us a little bit of time. Um, I think we were going to have Sarah Sadie, become a panelist. There she is. Um, Sarah, do you want to introduce yourself? Sarah and I already did. Sure. Hi, folks. I I have a I feel like I'm beaming in and I hope my face isn't too big or something, but <laughs> it's wonderful to meet you all. I, uh, I, my name is Sarah Saidun. I am a climate planner with Linnaean. Thanks so much for making the time for us to talk with you all about uh, where we're at with the Penobscot Climate Action. Uh, awesome. Did you have for the presentation? Yep, you got it. So yeah, Penobscot Climate Action. We wanted to stop by today to give you an update on where we're at in the process or interview with council, introduce you to the process. We're already quite a ways through, so there's a lot to update you all on. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, I will give you a very brief project background and who the partners are on this project. And then I'll pass it to Sarah to give a phase one and phase two overview next steps, and then, of course, questions from you all. Thank you. So this all started in 2021 when the town of Orno and the city of Bangor began talking about creating some sort of climate action and adaptation process. Bax was sort of roped in because we already have a regional process, we already have communication and uh, relationships with a lot of the towns in this region. Um, and it was kind of decided that it would be more beneficial for you all, for the town, as well as for everyone, if it were at a regional scope rather than a single municipality approaching the plan, um, because obviously impacts are going to be felt worldwide um, and any sort of implementation actions to increase resilience would be much more impactful on a larger scale. So that's how we were kind of brought in. Um, and University of Maine was also brought in as a partner because of the expertise that they provide and all of the research that they do in the area. So we have Dan Dixon on our project management team. So he's been a part of the process from the very beginning. Um, in 2022, we kicked off phase one of the project, which looked at identifying what our vulnerability areas are and also creating an emissions inventory for greenhouse gases. So um, we did a lot of public outreach, we did a lot of data collection, and we have already released a vulnerability assessment and greenhouse gas inventory. It's on our website if you wanna take a look. Um, it has a lot of really good information on what this area specifically could be looking at experiencing, which Sarah will talk about a little bit more. Um, and now we are in 2023. We are, we've already kicked off phase two, which will be a lot more public engagement, a lot more, um, you know, research into what specific strategies we could implement to address the vulnerabilities we identified in phase one. Um, the funding for this whole process comes from a lot of different areas. Bax is funding some of it through our planning funds, which we get from Federal Highway Administration and uh, Federal Transit Administration. And then the Town of Orno and City of Bangor have also contributed through uh, the Community Action Grant, which um, is through the governor's office. I will pass it over to Sarah. Great, so Maddie already uh, kind of talked through the slide, but this is just a visual of the um, of the project team. So we have uh, Bax, the city of Bangor, and the town of Orono. We also have uh, folks from the consultant team. I am a consultant with Linnaean. Um, we also have the BSC group and uh, Integral, which is now Introba, uh, helping us with the technical pieces of uh, the greenhouse gas emissions inventory and the climate vulnerability assessment. Uh, and we have our advisory committee that's steering the entire process. And there are folks 
uh, from the town of Orono and the city of Bangor on the advisory committee. Um, there are also folks from uh, across the region uh, supporting, making sure that our the process is staying true to uh, community values and the kind of priorities of the region. Um, so again, as Maddie mentioned, phase one consisted of a greenhouse gas emissions inventory and a climate vulnerability assessment. All of that information is on the website, so I'm going to speed through this, but the, the essentials are that um, these uh, inventories and assessments were conducted to identify uh, the region's environmental impact, the, where greenhouse gas emissions are, are coming from, uh, what's at risk because of climate change, and what systems are already resilient. Uh, to set the foundation of information with which we develop data-driven mitigation and adaptation strategies. So um, greenhouse gas emissions, for example, were identified by emit by um, per capita, by source and by sector, and all of that is broken down in the report on the site on the website. Uh, the vulnerability assessment really kind of zoned in on what's changing. We were looking at climate project projections for Maine and Central Maine from a, a um, various resources. We looked at what's risk because of what's changing and the foundation that exists that can be built upon uh, as we move forward into the phase two. And so some, again, some high level kind of takeaways are that uh, what we're really looking at for this region is that temperatures are rising, there will be more frequent extreme precipitation and flooding um, and sea level rise, which will impact the Penobscot River, um, some of which is highly influenced. And we're really looking at um, the impacts, health impacts on vulnerable populations, especially seniors, disruption of transportation and other infrastructure for essential services and small business, uh, the, the impact on the local economy. But we did also through interviews and engagement that we've done so far, we've we found that there is a really strong foundation uh, for building resilience that already exists and that's already kind of in the works, already happening. Uh, you know, there's a really strong network of community-based organizations, municipal staff and advocacy groups are all really excited about this process and really engaged. And so we're, um, that kind of brings us into phase two, which I'm gonna start with the desired endpoint, <laughs> uh, which is a series of, of, of several toolkits that will be that will outline specific strategies that can be easily and quickly implemented to address uh, local issues and priorities to draw down greenhouse gas emissions adapt to the impacts of climate change and build resilience uh, across the region so there will be a regional vision that's kind of set but the toolkits will allow uh, specific municipalities, towns, um, advocacy groups to draw down to site specific actionable next steps uh, with and our part of the our process will identify windows of opportunity for implementation, funding streams that could support implementation, um, local and regional champions that could also support implementation. Um, and we're really hope we're really, our vision for the process is really to build capacity and momentum for this work to um, just really easily move forward uh, at, at the end of, of phase two. And just to give you, uh, again, a, a, a zoomed out view of what these toolkits could look like, these are just examples, um, but they're, they're, they'll be short, they'll be easy to read, there'll be plenty of graphic elements um, and different sections that are relevant to different audiences for folks to kind of uh, tailor to their own uh, unique either regulatory contexts or cultural contexts or community contexts. Uh, I'm going to zoom through the, the schedule. I want to make sure that I'm respecting everyone's time. So uh, the we've already kind of kicked off phase two uh, with, with some engagement, some relationship and network building. We've been engaged with the advisory committee. Uh, we have spent quite a bit of time uh, setting priorities and principles that will drive the uh, identification of solutions and strategies that will be included in the implementation toolkits. So uh, we are moving, now we're in June, we're in the summer, we're moving into the solution co-creation phase. Um, and that will be really focused on identifying local priorities and um, uh, priority issue areas that will drive the um, creation of the strategies, like I said. So we are um, 
we'll be spending quite a bit of time in the summer and into the fall on that. We'll be uh, developing the mitigation and adaptation adaptation strategies concurrently. Um, and at the end of the process, you know, late 2023, early 2024, uh, we'll be launching the toolkits with a series of implementation workshops. So there's opportunities for folks to really um, have these documents and have them be live and not just be a, plan, a, a long plan that kind of sits on a shelf. Uh, and then the, this, um, project period will wrap in March of 2024. Uh, and just to, to get a little, uh, a little more in depth on what each of these stages includes, uh, we've been developing surveys and pop-ups uh, to work with folks on kind of a lighter touch level. Uh, and so each stage includes one survey, a series of pop-ups, and we'll include working group meetings um, where we'll be kind of culling all of that uh, feedback from community members through those surveys and through the pop-ups and uh, ensuring that that feedback is integrated into decisions and design and the, of the strategies themselves. Um, and so we are, we've wrapped the first survey. Um, we wrapped kind of our first series of pop-ups. We're moving into, uh, we've developed a survey related to kind of drill down into what strategies, where folks are, um, where fo how folks would like to prioritize strategies uh, moving forward. We are sent, we've sent out uh, working group invitations. I should mention that the working group themes are centered around housing, transportation, um, environment and quality of life, uh, local livelihoods and local economy and health. Um, and so we're finding strategies that intersect uh, between climate and these priority areas that have emerged from the first stage of engagement um, and from our phase one uh, assessments. Um, and so we've been reaching out to local leaders in those um, in those area issue areas to be a part of the working groups to really help us get get clear on what implementation of these strategies would look like in a realistic way for, for um, each town's uh, regulatory and cultural context. Um, and we're moving into, again, the mitigation and adaptation, adaptation strategy development phase. Um, so I'm gonna pause there for questions. I'm happy to answer. I know Maddie and Sarah are also happy to answer any questions, but I wanted to make sure it was brief as possible. So thank you all for your time. I would just like to mention that um, we'd like to thank Orno staff because they've been a really critical part of this process and they've been really great to work with. But the advisory committee as well has a lot of representation from Orno outside of staff. So that's been really great to have that perspective as well on the advisory committee. That's really wonderful to hear. And that is a good segue. That kind of was my question is which... Um, staff members, and also you mentioned Dan Dixon, but I'm curious, other community members are part of the, um, the working group so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so honestly, a lot of residents of Orno have been really involved. Um, I've met various ones through like other conferences and other work that I've done, and they've mentioned an interest in this plan specifically, and so we've kind of plugged them into their interest area. So like Sarah said, one of them was really interested in health because that's what they do for their work. And another, I, I, we have some really, a really interesting mix of working group members. Some work in the area that they're in and others, like we have a physical therapist who's really interested in, um, I think it was the transportation working group. So it's just kind of interesting to get all of those different perspectives um, from people who are professionals in that and kind of think that way, but also those who just have lived experiences in those areas. So from a staff perspective, we have plugged in, uh, Megan Hess is probably our, our biggest. Yeah, she wrote the brief. Yes, allows pay for it. Kind of an assumption, but yeah. 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 So um, that's our environmental services coordinator, um, Bell, our assistant manager. I have been on the edges, mostly outside of meetings, providing guidance. Um, Kyle Drexler, our planner. I don't know. Yeah, Rob has helped. Rob. Rob. <laughs> well, Cheryl is also um, on our advisory committee. She's been on the advisory committee. And 
Dan Dixon and Maureen Tyne, and then a bunch of other community members that have just come in when they saw the advertisement. So there's been, we've been pushing surveys, we've been pushing the ability to get involved. I think one of the things, the reasons that we're here is for council to help a little bit with that, to promote the effort that has gone on with that. I think Megan has links on the website to this effort. So if you drive people to the environmental services page, it will get them what they need. Does that make this? Sense? Yes. And this effort has its own dedicated website as well that has links on our website, on, on the environmental services page. So it can be, it's a resource, all things Penobscot Climate Action. Yeah, it's easy to remember. It's just PenobscotClimateAction.org. <laughs> that's, the whole, that's the whole name of the website. And that has the... The previous reports from phase one, it also has a data viewer where you can go in and zoom in and uh, kind of toggle on different vulnerable features like flooding or heat island effects. And you can look at your house or, you know, your route to work or things like that um, to kind of see what you will personally experience. Cool. Well, is, the, is the survey that's on our website the most recent iteration? It's not like the leftover link from the phase one survey. This is the current phase two survey. So the most recent survey we had closed actually just at the end of May. And so this next one just opened beginning of June. I'm not sure if what's on your website is the second survey or whether it's the first, but. So we'll double check that. And I'm sure by tomorrow will be the, if it's not already the first. It was, so. Yeah, but I've also just given um, Bell uh, printout sheets of the QR code. So they're going to be posted at the town office as well. I can make sure that everyone has that the link to the most recent survey, uh, Maddie, if we can coordinate on that. Yeah. Great. And I saw looking at your timeline, you've got this period of co-creation coming up. I'm curious if um, if there is is this survey the ask for what to direct people to in that regard? Are there other things that you're looking to draw, drive people toward? Just wanting to make sure that we're spreading the word about all the opportunities for involvement. Yeah, so the survey would be a really great, easy way for people to get plugged in just because it's relatively short and it's not, doesn't really take any, uh, a lot of time or effort. Um, but also the pop-up events, we're trying to go to as many, there's a lot of events going on in the summer, obviously. And so, I mean, just this weekend, Sarah and I were at the Brewer River Walk on Saturday. It was, it was a little very, <laughs> we, we lost a, a, a tent um, with the wind, but I mean, people actually engage really, really well at the pop-up events. So even just a couple hours, we can get a lot of people and have really good conversations. Um, so yeah, if, if you have any events in the area, either let us know or tell people to see, look for us yeah. there because we're probably going to be there. I wonder if the Orono Farmer's Market on some Saturday would be a pretty good pop-up. Mm -hmm. I've seen people tabling there get quite a bit of traction. And yes, might... I'm in contact with the good. person who's, who's running that. I'll think about it and others can too if you think of other opportunities. Yeah. Well, I'll add that. We are, um, there's an events tab on the PenobscotClimateAction.org site where we're listing all of the events that we'll be tabling at or we'll be participating in as a pop-up. So if folks are asking you and they're curious like where they can engage with us at events, you can direct them to that uh, tab on our website as well. Any other questions for our guests while we have them here? I, I would just like to say, if you don't have questions, that the town of Orono so appreciates the partnership with VAX. Um, this is just another example of how they support individual members while also making a regional effort. Because when we first approached them, they weren't 100%. This was not exactly in their bailiwick. And they really stretched. And now we all see how it is absolutely integral to planning for the region which they do a great job there. For $2,000 a year, I don't think we buy a better service. Thank you. We <laughs> appreciate that. Yeah. All right. Well, right. Let's Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah I really you appreciate you being here. Thanks so much Thank for bringing us up to speed. Yeah, we will we'll be back. Hopefully, right. yeah, see you more updates. <laughs> Thank you all. It was wonderful to meet you. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, that concludes our budget workshop. We have a uh, Brief town manager's report. I've been working on the budget. A lot of work on the budget. Mm, um, 
the um, the flags are up on the bridge. Eventually, um, we will get the um, crosswalk painted in rainbow. I think the goal at this point is to get it done before the end of the month. Um, weather contractor to paint the crosswalk and staffing are a little bit of an issue right now. We were shooting for the end of this week. I was giving you the rain is going to mess us up. Promise so, under promise over yeah. deliver. That's the way it's supposed to work. It's going to stop rain until. Yeah, right. it's ever going to stop. Before we transition out of our subcommittee's meeting into our budget workshop, is there any public comment regarding our committee work? Yes. It's not related to your committee work, but could you all please remember to speak up loudly? Yes. Because with the fans running, it's almost impossible to hear. I can hear Sonia, I can hear Sophie, nobody else. Okay, well, so thank you. If you would speak up, we would appreciate it. Yes. Thank you for letting us know. Thank you. All right, so let's close our uh, Ornard Town Council committee's meeting uh, and open our Ornard Town Council budget workshop um, with a discussion of uh, public works operating capital budgets. Um, this is where we left off at our last workshop. We had um, not yet touched the public works capital budget. Um, did we have questions? Let's do this. Let's entertain questions about the operating part of that budget before we address the capital part of that budget. Back. Yeah, Mark, you want to go Switch my file. Okay. I don't want to delay. Uh, if somebody wants to start with questions or comments regarding the material that we talked about in our last budget session. Um, yeah, so are we, <clears throat> I don't, are we going straight to the two positions or, or do you want to see if there's something else? Uh, I thought we'd talk about, that's certainly part of this. Let's talk about any other little things before we, the two positions are the big thing. Right. So any other smaller questions or concerns about specific lines or areas in the budget? Is this where we could talk about the curbside recycling in terms of both when we'll know if we're really recycling is my you know what the when there's a chance for improvement or better visibility into how our recycling is treated after we after it's picked up here and then if there's an alternative if recycling's not what the expectation is, is there an alternative for those resources that we could look at as part of the budget discussion? And so we're talking please, about, please. Yep. so we're talking about the um, recycling curbside collection, which is for residential, and then the tip fee, which we've estimated at $225, $230 a ton. Paying $225 now. So if I understand the question, if I get off track, call me back yep. in. Um, so we know exactly what happens to recycling when it goes to, when it was going to the Hamden plant. We knew 100%. Um, there was absolute transparency there. Um, with Casella, we are paying them to pick it up. We are assuming it is being, you know, it's going through a process. They are telling us, I have no reason to, Doubt Pine Tree, who is our collect our collector. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what the percentage is that gets recycled. I know that it's moving out of this area. Um, so when you ask me when I'll know for certainty what is happening with recycling in terms of processing, is it being processed? How is it being processed? That will be if and when the Hamden plant is back operation. So there is a meeting tomorrow. Um, where the MRC Board of Directors is reviewing final documents 
the um, schedule at this point is for the um, plant to be sold um, this summer and then for it to start working through a process. So it's been shuttered for two years. Yep. So it's not like they're gonna, they have turned it on. It is working, which is a great thing. It's in much better shape than anybody thought it would be. Um, but ultimately it's probably gonna be, I think the goal that we've said publicly, the goal is for us to be, or for the plant to be accepting MSW around the beginning of next year. So we probably would be looking at MSW first because it goes to landfill. Mm -hmm. We know 100% of that goes to landfill if it's not being processed. The perk plant is up for auction um, in early July. So that is an incineration as kind of our fallback, which hasn't been that great of a fallback recently, but that won't be an option. So, or might not be an option. So I really, I feel like, Everything is in um, absolute, I won't use the word chaos, but there's no, there's a lot of flux happening oh, here. Great. Yes. And I would not ever want to be quoted as guaranteeing or, with, or saying with any certainty what is going to happen next. I do know that ultimately the goal would be to get to a place where we are all in one bin and using that material in a good way, not in a low tier wasteful, so we can say we recycle way. Um, I can't tell you now, I can tell you from staff's perspective, the reason that curbside pickup and um, single sort tip fee is in the budget is because that's the last direction we had from council. So, from our perspective, this is 100% a service level decision that belongs with the council. Yeah. If you want a collection program, this is the way, the only way that we're, uh, we are aware of that you can make it happen right now. Because um, otherwise we'd be buying lots of capital well, we equipment. Spend. Yeah, we could spend a lot, but I don't think okay. that we would see that as reasonable. Yeah. Um, or so, that's why it's here. It's either this or kind of not do it. And yeah. no. when we looked at um, the idea of could we do it less frequently, mm -hmm. that creates a whole set of head operational headaches that ultimately don't save money. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'd be hesitant to, yeah, I'm sympathetic to the call, the, the concerns that we're not sure if we're getting as much value for that extra money as we ought to be getting. But I'm also, I, I would not want to eliminate a program that people have an expectation around without communicating with them why and that we've got a better alternative for them. So it's kind of a challenging spot. So I, I also think that um, we, once the plant is up and running, so let's assume we live in a world where April 1st of next year, the plant's up and running and taking recycling. I would still be at the place that Rob and I were at when we made the recommendation when the plant first came online to wait and see what the performance of the plant is before we went to all in one bin. I think because we can take sorted recycling there for a much cheaper rate. Mm -hmm. um, and it allows us to keep collecting, but let's look at what's happening so we don't end up at like communities that went all in one bin and are recycling and our landfilling recycling. So I just wanna have you repeat that last bit one more time. So there's an advantage to keeping the two bin system in part because if and when the plant reopens, we'll get a better price for having those things sorted in the short term. Okay, yep. great. Yep. Um, so we pay, we pay half the tip rate awesome. for recycling. They might come back to us and try to get us to pay a little bit more than half, but it will be less than the tip. Okay. Um, and in terms of our uh, sort of contracts moving forward with Pacella, um, can you remind us, Rob, what you were saying the other day about various lengths of time of contracts and sure. um, so what the assumption is in for this value that's in our budget for yeah. a one-year contract or so contract? The budget carries a similar level of service that we're providing now. Right. So it would be 
um, the zero sort collection every other week and an MSW collection weekly. Um, the, you know, normal, the standard resident wouldn't see any change in the delivery of service that way. Um, we are about to put that out to bid because our contract is about to end um, with Pine Tree right now. Um, when those come back, of course, we'll see the bid results. We'll bring that information to you all to help make a decision on the path forward. But as part of that RFP, we're gonna ask for alternative methods for delivering that service. So kind of like the one that we talked about with the automated side dump collection that we talked about a while ago, um, that may come at a lesser rate cost-wise, but they'll probably be asking because of the investment in the fleet and infrastructure that they need to provide that service that way, be asking for a little bit more time commitment. So um, a standard double collection contract labor we're in right now is probably gonna be like a three to five year commitment. If we were to um, move forward with something that includes automated collection, those kinds of things, they're probably gonna be asking for five to 10 just to make sure that they don't put all that uh, investment out there and then we don't continue the service with them. So, um, and there, there may be some other uh, firms, other methods that get proposed that kind of like the base bid and then give me some other ideas kind of thing. Um, and so when those results come back, we'll come and share them with you. And you, uh, <clears throat> I think you said uh, advised that Bangor does not do recycling. Is that correct? They are all in one bin. They have side dump, so they limit the amount of waste that can go can be collected. Um, and they um, put recycling and the trash. Everything goes in one bin. Mm -hmm. What other town? Does what other towns are doing the to the recycle the way we're doing it? Um, Blue Hill, City Mount, Town. Dessert, Old Town. No. Brewer. No, Brewer's all in one no. bin. And Maine is doing Maine it the way we're doing it. Right. Maine is doing it exactly the way we're doing it. I, I feel like this is kind of the worst kept secret going is that we're kind of recycling in name only. And it's, I, I, I kind of feel like if we, if we stop doing it, that it may drive innovation and we may actually turn it in. I think there was some discussion about putting those funds aside to be able to invest in something. But I feel like stopping doing something that we know is not happening uh, just for the we're paying for it. And we have no idea what's really happening, but we don't believe much is happening. I think it could drive innovation and we could actually get some real recycling somehow. If 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 community members are upset, then then. I think they come forward and we work on on a solution personally, but because I think it was it's what is it seventy thousand dollars for the for the sake of saying that we're recycling seems just a little silly to me. Well, it seems it's also about maintaining the infrastructure for, um, I mean, hopefully for a process that should work yeah. better if things go well. Yeah, and, and I see the value in continuing investing to keep that infrastructure going. Yeah. What do you mean by infrastructure? Well, I just I just mean like the the way we're sorting it right now though. Two bin system. Yeah. Just like the systems that we have in place. Maybe infrastructure might be the wrong yeah. word. But. The, 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 the two bins that people keep at their homes? Maybe? I guess so. Um, but also like basically the, the service we're currently paying for uh, keeping people's expectations. Once you change a system, I think it's hard psychologically for people um, to get back into that mindset. I mean, it's my understanding from what staff has told us that it took um, a lot of outreach and education to get people on board with how this system currently works but i don't know open to hearing what others think yeah. i mean I, i'm no i'm no fan of uh you know just spending money just to feel good i mean i, I agree with you on that yeah. point i yeah i'm a little bit of two minds because i similarly don't want to be sort of recycling for the sake of greenwashing patting ourselves on the back and feeling good about it but also uh, it's not as if we know that it's not working we know that it's not the most optimal system, but mostly we just don't know what the fate of things is. And we need to acknowledge that there's probably a lot of fluctuation within it based on markets for what um, sort of our waste stream can get for various recycled products and how much ends up where um, over time. Um, so I'm 
there's part of me that's like, yes, perhaps we could take $77,000 and use it for something really that we know would be effective, like micro grants for people in our community with great ideas about how to support environmental initiatives. And that would be a palpable sort of known good. But I, I also hear what Rob is saying about the real utility in kind of keeping people's habits um, around what a year from now may be a really good process to have the suitable infrastructure for. I think I want to be sure that we're not taking for granted the process. So zero sort recycling, Casella and Pine should provide that in good faith. Yeah. This is not, you know, I, I feel like um, I don't want to take away from the credibility of the, yeah. of the contractor that we're using. The process of zero sort recycling in its nature creates contamination. Um, and there's always residuals, no matter how try how, how hard you try, keep those materials as clean as possible. So I just want to make sure it's the process, it's not the company mm -hmm. that we're dealing with here. Yeah. Agreed. Makes some sense. So, but if we ask, I mean, if we asked and if we ask, what is, I mean, they they bring in X ton and Y ton goes to a landfill. That seems like that's a fair question to ask if it's if it's proprietary information that they can't share i guess that's one thing but it, that does seem like a fair question that we could ask to know i mean that that's not our specific obviously but if they're a plant they're measuring what's coming in they're measuring what's coming out and going to going to landfill if that's a again if it's 50 percent, then probably we feel okay about it if it's 25 percent, maybe we don't feel okay i think that that would be useful information in my opinion to make an informed decision if it if it's attainable so we we can't get that information in time for this budget though mm -hmm. right so well i don't know is that a is it a phone is it a phone call we we get the budget and we're not they're not probably finalizing everything tonight or thursday i mean is it a phone call that, that tomorrow right? the, the number that comes to mind is about a fifth to a quarter of it is is wasted fifth to, so so 20, 25 percent is wasted. I mean, if I think that's that I would support that. Okay? That's easy. I think if that is what they say, if that's the answer, that then I take it back. I didn't mean it. Go. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like yeah. Keep it out. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Although I do want to see this <laughs> do you think incredibly investing in other ways of yeah. you know, do environmental work. But of course we are doing lots of that. We have a great environmental services coordinator who's finding- some nice people here earlier. It's clearly doing good stuff. work. Yeah. Hey Rob, can you also just clarify when we switch back to the other plant, is it a different process then entirely yeah. so that this amount of wastage would be different? I mean, you were saying it's mostly a process issue, not a company. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I think initially, mm -hmm. um, like Sophie was talking about, we're going to take that with a grain of salt and sure. try to- you know, get some hard data from the from the plant itself, but eventually you would get hopefully to a place where um, the material can be all in one bin, collected, then brought to the site, cleaned, sorted through all the different methods that we had hoped were, were going to work. Um, I don't know if they're still looking at biofuel, but that adds a an added level of reuse because it takes all the organics that are left, they get washed off the plastics and glass and um, treated and actually made into a, a reusable fuel. So, um, you know, that if you can get to that and 50% was the, the, the floor at, at the beginning of MRC's process with the ceiling being as high as I I heard 85%, but 80%. So um, depending on how successful uh, you can turn around plastics and how much biofuel you actually end up with, but um, which would be, you know, uh, we're closer to 25%, between 25 and 50 right now with our residential stream. So um, if they got to 50, that would be an improvement. So our current process is at 25 to 50, and you're hoping the next one would be 50 or higher. Yeah, above 50 for sure. Yeah. The current one's at 25 to 50. Yeah. Right. Got it. 
Thanks. What was the 20, 20, what was the percentage you just gave? You said up to 20. Right now we're getting our, our uh, residential streams about 1,250 ton and 250 of that gets recycled, so. That's the lower percentage. When it goes, if it, if it goes to Hamden and it's working the way it was, um, it, that is all in one. So you're looking at percentage of recycling to the amount of MSW and recycling that's brought into the plant. Uh, so it goes through a wash. There's a bunch of optical sorters. The material gets washed. They may create a pulp, which would make a biofuel, but the, the floor on that, meaning they're not meeting their um, contractual obligations if they are below 50% of total recycling to what comes in. And so it takes time. So are, are we entertaining a cost reduction, which would mean that we would have a change or reduction in service at, at this point for this budget? I don't think so. Okay. okay. All right. So let's talk about any other kind of smaller things before we talk about the two positions. So is there anything else in the PW operations part of the budget that we'd like to discuss? Well, maybe I'll ask Dan, are you comfortable starting this discussion? Oh, so just, yeah, I'd be happy to. Okay. No, I'd be, you know, be happy to. Um, I guess it's. Um, so we've talked about these two positions and we've heard some concerns here around the table and, and um, from others about um, what it means in particular uh, uh, winter our winter storm response. So the challenge with our budget is all the positions, you know, people costs are expensive and we value them and we, we pay for them. And we haven't taken as a council, I think we've been very careful not to look at, we've had many proposed reductions for us to consider. And many of them had things to do that impacted the quality of life for our work, you know, the, the benefits and the, and the support we provide to our workforce. We have two positions that are open in public works. And thank you to, to Rob for being, taking this seriously and giving us something to look at as a council. Um, <clears throat> my, we've talked about leaving those two positions open. And I know that creates a concern around our, our winter response, and particularly how we manage walkability as a community. And we heard that when this has happened in the past, there have been um, been concerns expressed about it, and you know, the public came out and um, had conversations. So, what I, but what I'd like to do is suggest that we take um, we take this opportunity for the savings and leave the positions vacant, but not eliminated. I think Sophie, that was we talked earlier today. And then consider a, bring people, a group of stakeholders together where we'll talk about, um, and I'm not talking about a long, year long process or anything, but bring some folks together from the community who represent different facets of walkability and talk about what it is that we can do. We call, I call it a winter walkability pilot project. We talk about, you know, assess the importance of walkability um, as a communal value and articulate uh, our expectations around winter maintenance. Also, not just the expectations, the community's expectations, but communicate back to people what that could mean for sec plowing secondary roads and things like that. If it is, if through the citizens engaged process, we really drive to decision-making prioritization and resource allocation around downtown walkability in, in response to snowstorms. So I, I hope that it's a conversation that gets ahead of any angst or concerns and helps us articulate in a better way what we want as a community in terms of uh, walkability generally, but specifically during, during snowstorms. And um, throw that out again, this is, there aren't a lot of easy pickings in, in our budget for, for cost savings. And I am coming to terms with that as a counselor in terms of we have these commitments and so many of these things are beyond our control, but I think we have to start thinking about how do we find opportunities and engage our community in the discussion about what, what it truly values and, and what we can do in the budget process to that forward or you know, respond to that. 
Well stated. That's basically what you gave us. That, that's what you had in your thing last. last yeah, week, right. That we yep. didn't. That we didn't see quite before. And I don't think it needs to be an ordinance. No, you know that was kind of me spitballing. It could just be, you know, we have a discussion. Maybe it's an order. Maybe it's a, you know, we have a. Maybe there's plenty of direction already within the department. Uh, you know, we don't have to cost, put this in the constitution or anything like that. But just you know, so, uh, a vision that that we have that we can agree to generally about. What our what our sense what our priorities are? Yeah, I think I think that is, was well said. Um, I wonder, Rob, can you talk about priorities? Because there was some, or maybe maybe so, but you had said something about statute that something had, that roads have to be done. Maybe it's state highways or something like that. Can you talk briefly, maybe on that? You can talk about the law. Yeah. Okay. So I um, on a different piece of paper had the statutes written down. I can get them to folks. Okay. But there are kind of four different things that are guiding me right now and guiding us in our um, our um, recommendations to council. The first is um, there is state law that says that towns shall make roads passable. And I think um, in all of the training that we've had, it all focuses around a good faith effort. So making your effort to make the roads passable and travelable. When you look at the urban compact, which is uh, most of our, a lot of our road miles are in, within yeah. the urban compact, um, we are required to keep them travelable and make a, make a good faith effort to keep them travelable. When we look at um, the, um, we receive about $70,000 a year from the state for state aid roads. And um, that is specific to winter maintenance. Um, and uh, so there's an obligation, a contractual obligation with that. And I don't think it's an individual contractual obligation. I don't think we can say we won't take the money. I think we are, they push the money to us and for that money, we are expected to provide a service. Mm -hmm. And that's good faith too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the th the third thing is um, we have liability for walkways and um, sidewalks appurtenant to municipal buildings, which means the public safety building is open 24 hours a day. They would expect the walk did to be able to get into and people to be able to park here. Um, there has been some case law around road defects. So it's really clear there's a big sinkhole in the middle of a road. Once we're made aware of it, we have 24 hours to fix it or else we own whatever damage arises from that. Um, ice in itself, the test case, the um, municipality was out making a good faith effort and the roads were still slippery. It was held that was not a road defect. However, um, I don't, and I, I sent something out to the town attorney and have not gotten a response back, but my question was specific to our plan and the size of our community, because I also think when you look at things, um, it does kind of, we, ha we have more expectation on us than a very, very tiny yeah. town would have. So um, that's kind of what we're, um, from the legal standpoint, what is guiding us. You want to talk about prioritization? Yeah, so uh, operationally, we, um, with our current model, split all the roads up into five separate routes that we found. Um, the during a storm, um, while actively plowing, while it's snowing, um, we focus on maintaining the roads. Uh, if it's during the day, during business hours or whatever, we'll um, try to keep the parking lots as good as we can. Um, but while we're actively plowing, it's difficult to maintain the sidewalks because we're plowing snow onto the sidewalks constantly. So um, the roads come first. As the storm starts to dwindle down, um, and if, again, depending on timing and all of these other issues, what staff's available, what staff has been, because um, we have our 16 hours on, eight hours off. So depending on where the end of the storm falls, um, we may not have all of our staff available 
um, while they're in that eight hour time in between shifts. Um, we'll begin to transition to cleaning up parking lots, schools, and then ultimately once those start to get to the almost to the end portion, then we transition as much resources as we can to sidewalks. Um, we have three primary uh, sidewalk routes. The first one starts right here downtown. Um, the uh, Generally, the first sidewalk that we'll do is the main street piece down Ferry Hill across the bridge, turns around Webster, goes up to College Avenue and comes back across the bridge. So we know that that's an important place to get cleared up because there aren't a lot of options for people to walk over there. Um, and then that person will come up through downtown and go through the school area. So if we only have one machine out, one person available, that's the first route that happens. The other one is an, another Main Street route that goes up and takes care of College Avenue and Park Street. And then the third run is um, starting at Bennett Road and going out toward um, Stillwater Avenue. That's when we, that's the end of the storm. Um, then we'll transition to hauling snow out of the parking lots and stuff. From of those last of the five on the road routes, are there there must be prior are they prior assigned priorities for those five or no? No, so the the five routes encompasses all the roads that we have. But do you but do you there's no prioritizing any of the, across those? Like if well, so we've got um, the main so the the four big trucks have got sort of some of the main run sort of thing. So um, for example the truck that plows Park Street also has Colburn Drive. So Park Street's gonna get plowed more times than Colburn Drive does. So there's some prioritization there. We have two routes that are focused on neighborhoods that all they do is side streets. And those um, include, you know, uh, Tough End, Webster, Noise, all the little dead ends. There's 30 of them. So. And even with this setup, those side streets are going to get hit less often in the same storm as the main runs because yeah. they're so right. big, it takes time. Yeah, their routes are a little bit, and there's a lot more turns and twists and things like that. So people to be <clears throat> careful of. Yeah. Have you said it, it would not make sense to, and correct me if I'm not remembering this right, but you said it would not make sense to only fund one position um, because it takes two people to be running these. Yeah, so we were set up. So each of those five, five runs is assigned a truck, and two people are assigned to that truck yeah. so they can work opposite each other. So it's sort of two at a time. If that's, if we're going to go from five runs to four runs. <laughs> is this, I was, well, I was just going to follow up question on that. Um, so you, would, it, would it be? A violation in some way of our legal duty around prioritization if we were to still only fund one position but that person is dedicated to sidewalks to maintain our commitment to walkability while still making sure that roads are of course the team's first priority does that sound feasible or are there like things i'm not thinking of around that you could do that just it would still be um we'd still reduce the four run, four runs so that takes it's still going to take us a little bit longer so the level of service is still going to go down. Um, but having that person available for parking lots and sidewalks near the end of a storm would be helpful. Yeah. So, so it would still be a positive thing. Sure. I mean, obviously not in comparison to having both positions for you, but correct. Um, and so the, the sidewalk um, maintenance, winter maintenance, would still also see a service level reduction if we, if yes. we were. It would still be, it would take us longer to get to that point. So you're still working through, you're only, so instead of five trucks, you're only having four out <clears throat> doing the final cleanup on the streets. So we're not pushing snow back anymore. Mm -hmm. Now we can start the sidewalks. Right. Um, and then, like I said, as those people finish plowing roads, they come back, get in another, get into some other piece of equipment, whether it be um, a loader to push back to plow the parking lots or they'll start the other two routes for the sidewalk, so. I think the other piece is most everything else that you've heard tonight 
is roads, parking lots, uh, roads and sidewalks. It's based on the storm. The, t- the storm kind of sets the pace, right? Um, and I think where people will really see the reduction is when the storm ends right before dawn and we're still, it looks like a beautiful day and it's warm and everybody wants to get out and everything is still covered. Um, the piece that I am almost more concerned about in terms of service level impact is with the um, parking lots that are more time driven as opposed to storm driven. Can you so speak to that? Both, park, both the school parking lots, the RSU parking lots and the town parking lots have timing associated with them. So um, the municipal lots, you're not allowed to park between two and six to allow for winter maintenance. So if we can't get there in that two to six window, all we can kind of do, and they do start filling up pretty quickly. All we can do is kind of clean things up like we can, and we have to plan on coming in early the following day um, between that two to six window to do the final cleanup. So that delays things a little bit. Um, The school, we like to have those done by seven. Um, Staff usually starts showing up after that, if we're not done by seven, Bill's calling me. Um, but that, uh, you know, we're usually talking around five o'clock in the morning about where we're at with that and, um, you know, talk with Bill about the potential of, you know, do we need to cancel or are we going to look at a delay? Those kinds of things, those conversations happen about five o'clock in the morning. The, the storm timing, obviously, is going to be. When the snow comes, it's going to come into play as well. Because if, if it comes during the day and nothing at night, then you're kind of in that same pattern. You can't really hit the parking lots. You can't. Yeah, I mean, well, it's going to happen. If it snows, let's say it snows from seven in the morning till three o'clock in the afternoon. We're going to get out there, clean up everything in the streets. Um, storm that it's going to be like four inches of snow. So the sidewalks will go relatively quickly. We can do those. So we would be working on those. Um, we'd clean up the parking lots as best we can, but we'd set up a plan for a three or four o'clock start the next day to do the parking lots because we're in that two to six window. 3 a.m. No. Yeah, yeah 3 a.m. Mm-hmm. It ain't easy. <laughs> I had a question, Rob. Um, so I understood that the current sequence is always like roads and then parking lots and then sidewalks. And I totally understand that were we to do the sidewalks any sooner, we would have to do them again after the plot threat came by. But there isn't anything that actually stops us from doing them sooner, mm-hmm. correct? As long as we were willing to do them twice. Other than resources. Right. I, I understand. Yeah. Except just, our, our sidewalk guys are- No, if I had a sidewalk, they could be out the storm doing sidewalks. Right, that's what I'm saying. Because Rob asked if we did designate a person to, to sidewalks, which we can do. There's nothing that stops us from doing that by law. Didn't you say we already had a half? Well, someone says we can't do it. Right, yeah. got it. Um, didn't you say we already had a half sidewalk person at WPCF who was half PCF and half sidewalk? Or did I misunderstand something? So the important thing yeah. about that to yeah. remember is that that person, it takes, depending on how much snow we got, right. 12 hours or so, let's say to do the sidewalks after the storm is done. So that person can't be following sidewalks. Understood. For the, the whole storm too. So understood completely. I just I had you. truly yeah. a group dedicated to sidewalks, which I don't, I mean, that's, yeah. Yeah. that's a fact people yeah. in a storm, you, People plow the roads, yeah. they get out, they get in the front end loader, they plow the side of the parking lots, they get out of that, they get in the sidewalk machine and do sidewalks yeah. for 16 hours. So. Get it. And then was, they go home for eight hours and come back for 16 Yeah, they're amazing. Yeah, they come they're back just thoroughly snow, so. amazing in general. Um, can I also just ask how many sidewalk machines do we have? Three. Yes. And just to your question, Sarah, it used to be that we had a designated person that split six months in public works, six months at WPCF. From an operational standpoint, we discovered that the people that want to do this kind of work are not as interested in the pace at WPCF. So instead, what we do is we, Rob and Chris, 
schedule public works time to support WPCF. And in the budget, we show it as half and half of a laborer. But Chris just borrowed um, two of Rob's people for a day to fix a, a water line. And um, that's part of that 50-50 um, split. So, so it's not a, a physical person. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. I was just curious about like what we can do. I'm not saying we have the staff to do it. I just know there's a lot of interest in Orono about walkability and winter walkability in particular. And I think it's important, you know, that we all are thinking about <clears throat> all the options we do or don't have as we're looking at. So okay. I really appreciate it. That was super helpful. I know, I mean, you know, different parts around the world do that differently, right? I mean, and you know, we're in the US and we're pretty far ahead of the curve compared to a lot of Maine on winter walkability, but there are further we could go. It's just sort of an allocation of resources, as you guys always point out. So thanks. Can you just clarify? So right now it's it, it's two two crews of five, you said. This would be going to two crews of four. With two crews of five, are they they're all in plows at the beginning? Is that what you're saying? Five. Oh uh, yeah, five. Yes, five trucks. Five people. Okay. Four big trucks and one small one. Did you tell us yeah, smaller? It's like a medium <laughs> yeah. yeah. So so then we'd be going to four. Um, is it is it not possible to prioritize the main roads and and start out prioritizing sidewalks from a walkability ha having the sidewalk go out as well, understanding that that's going to impact the secondary roads and are going to take the brunt of that. As far as plow with three, yeah, and, and have someone immediately in the if if yeah immediately with a walkability hitting the sidewalk. So on the main what? drag because that's going to be okay for the half hour that between when that machine goes by and the plow truck goes by. My understanding it's still going to be plowing snow from the road to the right, and that's where the sidewalks are. And that in that scheme, we are intentionally determining that some roads in town. Are going to receive an incredibly low level service. You know, if we you still know, have to at some point plow all the roads with the three trucks. Yeah. And so with one truck, you're adding what did we figure? Well, 90, 90 minutes to the. Yeah, I mean, you'd make our runs 30 to 35 miles long. You go 15 miles an hour. Yeah, you said add in an hour or something, right? Is what you said in the original. That would add a lot more. Well, oh, what I'm oh. saying, what I'm saying now, you mean? Yeah. yeah. You went from five trucks to three trucks because you got somebody in the zipping around in the snowblow thing all the time. Right. So, Leo, you were asking about going from five to three instead of five. To no, four. just having just prioritizing with those four okay, yeah. prioritizing sidewalks. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Not not going from five to four. To three. I didn't understand. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. I, I made a comment last week and you know, I'm stuck on it. I'll make it again is that um, we are committing to uh, increasing um, service. We, we've committed a, a $9,500 increase to support a ski center, which I, I want to support. I agree with that increasing that level of support. Skiers are athletic, fit people who are going to go out and recreate and do great things. And we're contemplating at the same time, although I understand the numbers are different. The, the image and the reality is that we're contemplating lowering access to our public ways to some people who are very vulnerable and need those ways cleaned off at the same time that we're letting people ski. And that to me just doesn't sit right. So I know that this is a much bigger cost savings compared to a very small budget increase for, for skiing, but that kind of equity piece just doesn't, I have a hard time with that. Um, and I also think that there has been a perception in town or there was a perception in town in the past, and I haven't heard this for many years, and I'm glad I haven't heard it, that some people when I first moved to town said, oh, yeah, that's the street that always gets done. They're the street that always gets you know, their street plot, their sidewalk plot, whatever, and my street never gets touched. I haven't heard that for a couple of years because I think the PW has been really diligent about the way that they've distributed their service across the community. And I'm 
I don't want to head back into a situation where people are feeling, oh, geez, you know, the basin's taking it on the chin again because nobody cares about us because all we do is spend all our money on Main Street kind of thing. Um, I know that's not what we're thinking of doing. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid that is the unintended sort of consequence or, or um, kind of message that we're sending out when we talk about reducing a level of service that many people in our community rely on. Two of our drivers live in the basin, so I don't think they're going to take it on the chin. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anyone from the, the system is the system, Leo. And you know, I, I really I firmly believe that council, it is council's job to establish the level of service. You've heard that from me many, many times. I think the piece I, I just want to be very clear about um, is that the service level will go down. And I don't want to hear things like. I really hope you're not going to make it look bad, so council looks bad. Or um, I really, I really don't want you to see this fail. Or, well, what we really mean is, with 20% la less staff, we want you to make it look like it looks. And so it's, I go back to my original statements of set the service level and resources to be able to meet that level, and we will make your vision a reality but you set the service level in one place and you under-resource it, it's, it doesn't matter how hard we work, we're just not gonna be able to get it done. So this would be going back to the level of staff we had up until 2019 though, correct? Yeah, and in 2019, we went to council with a- The shared position. Up, up until 2019, there were eight, there were eight on those. 17. Oh, it was 17. It came in two different yep. iterations. I'm quite sure, I didn't research this, but um, when we first, uh, so it would have been 2016, um, this was the first year that we did the uh, shift limits. So that's when we implemented the 16 max eight we moved over to the public works grant in 15. Okay. okay. You guys need us here for this? So yeah. 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 One winner. Okay. And then um, we, we originally set it up with four on each side. Um, then we went to council, I believe, in 17 or 18 to add the other two positions to that. It was one year, I thought that was 19 when Council chose to not fund the shared position. And yes, that was when we saw that impact the level of service with sidewalks. Well, we, we were given the, the staffing chart that, that shows 2019 is when is when that went from but, eight to ten. Um and, and I, I guess my, my comment is having lived here since before that, I've always felt like we have had, you guys have done a phenomenal job. Better, I mean, more phenomenal with more staff, which makes sense. Uh, but I think Orno is usually compared to our neighbors since I've lived here. It's always felt like a really good job. So the two positions, Rob and I came to council at the time. And what drove that was not, quite frankly, level of service to the community. It was safety um, because the way the town was operating the snowstorm started, everybody got in a truck or a piece everybody of equipment and worked until the snowstorm was over and cleanup was done, which could be 24 hours. And um, coming from a community that also did that, but at nine o'clock, everybody was in bed snug and there were no people running around and running in front of plow trucks, which they do. Um, and a lot of people out and about, we became really concerned. The narrative in the industry has begun to shift to say that that is negligent, that putting somebody in a, in a 60,000 pound truck and freighting it with um, sand and salt and just saying, go forth until you're done, drink lots of coffee um, is not safe for the community. So when we came to council, what we talked about 
was how we could safely split the shifts. Yeah. Um, so reducing and comparing a service before to the service now is one of, one of the many times I will point to staff grew because the world has changed. I think that concern makes a lot of sense. And I'm also, I think, pretty much in the same position I was last week when we talked about this, which is to say that I, I think I agree with Jeff um, about the commitment to walkability and the level of service we currently have. Um, as somebody who walks a lot, I mean, it's not just a selfish concern, but I, I also know a lot of other people who are in the same boat as me. And it often does still feel, um, you know, when there is a particularly long storm, like, um, you know, with, I appreciate when the sidewalks do get plowed, but, um, you know, there's a lot of time when people are walking in the road and you have to watch walk behind you and to reduce the level of service that we currently have would feel very uncomfortable for a lot of people who are vulnerable who are walking. So I, I do take that pretty seriously in addition to our stated commitment around walkability generally. Uh, all of those you know, the concerns you just raised bring me to think that maybe I do still want to fund both these positions or at least one of them. Um, you know, if that results in slight reduction, maybe slight is a, a pithy word um, in this context, I'm not sure, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with not funding both at this point. I definitely would not want to see a decrease in the sidewalk plowing and the walkability for pedestrians. I'm with you 100% on that one. Um, I, I'm it does seem to me like we have the ability to prioritize pedestrians if we take it. Um, I'm at the moment still just listening and thinking through about the other two positions and how that would play out if we did prioritize sidewalks is something I'd like to hear more about. If we said, okay, the sidewalk plowing does have to stay where it's at now, because I haven't heard anybody say we're willing to see the sidewalk plowing go down, even though I've heard people be interested in maybe other plowing go down. If the sidewalk plowing stayed at the same level, and we just, that was like a stipulation. What would you do? Like if we said as a council, here's the instruction, you gotta keep the sidewalks where they're at, you can do what you want with everything else. What would you do? I'm just curious. Well, I, situation, I guess, it's a tough question to answer. I know it is, I that's why I'm giving it to give you. Give me the same amount of resources. That right, I, I know, have. but I'm saying so, if you don't get them, I, right? I, right. In, in some ways, I don't understand the question because the, the system that we, the approach right. that we use right now, right. with our level of resources that we have now, yeah. works. Right. I get it. And it's not like it works with a big bunch of contingency. It works like plowing sidewalks at 645, you know, uh, crosswalks and parking lots at the school at 645 to have them ready at 7. Yeah. That's, it works. So, any reduction in so if you if we said um, that we would want to keep the same number of same amount of resources dedicated to sidewalks, mm -hmm. then we'd have to look at we would need at least that one person. Mm -hmm. So like we talked about a little earlier, you would still reduce um, the street runs to four, mm -hmm. keep the same model by keeping that middle person dedicated to sidewalks, um, and we'd get through it. The challenges are still impact there. So you still, by allocating the resources to that one person dedicated to sidewalks, you're not necessarily maintaining the same level of service that we have now because the time and effort put into um, the streets and parking lots now just takes just that much longer. So it's still gonna delay our ability to respond as we do in this current model. So there's still gonna be an impact there. What, what level of impact that is kind of all depends. I mean, if we start sidewalks at 2 a.m. or 4 a.m., if you live on Main Street, you probably don't know, notice that. Um, but, um, you know, that's the, it's gonna be longer getting to the neighborhoods, um, those sorts of things, fewer resources. So when we shift. So everything sort of overlaps too. It has to, to make it work. Um, so while we're finishing up roads, we're sneaking over and starting parking lots. While the parking lots are starting to get finished, we're sneaking into the, into the, you know, it's not just sort of like a, 
okay, these are done. Let's go back to the shop and change to, to sidewalks. You know, that's not how it works. It's a constant transition, really. And that flows right into hauling snow. Even, even that, I mean, so now with fewer resources for that, even those things would people would notice the big pile by the fence on Pine Street is probably going to stay there an extra day. I don't know if that's important to council or not, but there's a lot of parking stalls down there. So is it is it accurate so, that the sidewalk plowing, when you're saying the routes would take about an hour longer to do, is it also accurate to say the sidewalk plowing would also finish about an hour later than it does now? Yeah, but it's going to be, it depends. If I can, if we can, if the if the end of the storm lands in a place where we have overlap, so I have the other four people to dedicate to the other parts of it, then probably things are going to happen in a similar delay. If that's four o'clock in the afternoon and the crew just finished up their 16 hour shift and all we have is the two people that to add to that other, then it's going to take longer. So and when we say it's going to take longer in order, it means that that 16 hour cycle takes longer and it means we're going to see higher overtime because there's still the same amount of hours of effort that will go into responding. So that's, and I can't tell you how much we'd have to, yeah, we'd have to see. Right? Be I, those, that would be really hard. Those comeback shifts. So we, we didn't get to the, at the parking lot by 6 a.m. Couldn't finish cleaning it up. I got to bring a crew in at 4 a.m. the next day instead of doing it right then. Is anyone from the public that might want to have anything to say? Or anything? Look, yeah, sure. I mean, we always welcome public comments, so any anytime. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like to speak. Yeah, Great. go ahead. Uh, my name is Eric DeSola. I know many of you. Um, and uh, a lot of the work I do, I work with the Bicycle Coalition of Maine. A lot of the work we do is advocating for better biking and walking throughout the state. And what I see a lot of is, um, is we start at a place where roads are for cars, infrastructures for cars, resources are to support car travel. And then when we talk about resources and budgets, it's always taking away from automobile traffic in order to give for pedestrians and bicycles and other active transportation. And um, I think it's really, it, it would be really important to think about starting at a place where roads are public places for people and their tax dollars that are supporting this public area. And then thinking about how we want to allocate that space for all the users. So, I actually brought some printouts, and I'd love for you to just consider looking at it. It's very hard to summarize stuff on here. But there's a really great resource that the city of Portland, Oregon created, and it's a, it's a car master plan. We see pedestrian master plans, bicycle master plans, but it's rare to see a car master plan. And what they did with this master plan is really look at the resources that the city of Portland is giving to automobiles and how that detrimentally affects vulnerable users. Why make a car master plan so we can see cars? Why make a car master plan so we can understand how drivers use cars now? So we can honestly assess how cars are now bankrupting people, cities, states, and nations. I'm not trying to dramatize this. This is just what it says. <laughs> and, and so we can plan for the future. So there's a lot going on in a city like Portland. It's different than Orono, but I think that we're still doing the same thing here in, in a small town where we're prioritizing automobile travel and automobile parking spaces over the safety and walkability of, of the town. Um, and we're all, we, we probably all know people that could walk, but we have this sort of system now set up where it's easy and normal to just get in a car and drive one mile, two miles. And so, we looked at the city of the town of Orono and thought about how can we make walking better year round, but especially in winter, even on one day when the snow is falling, and support people who are walking on that day. We can encourage more people to walk. We can meet the walkability goals. Looking at this poster back there too, talking about greenhouse gas emissions. These are all things that we can meet. 
And so some things I wrote down as I'm listening to this conversation, which has been very interesting. Um, why not accept a lower level of services on roads and parking lots? If we can create that normality and make sure the public is up on board and supportive of this, then that's something that we could do as a town, creating that service and then meeting it with the resources available. I see a lot of times the plow comes through and it's gonna be a warm day and everything melts anyway. So when possible, can we work with the weather to coordinate what plow usage is going on? There's one inch on the road and that plow comes through and puts like three inches on the sidewalk. Maybe that wasn't necessary because in one hour it was all gonna turn the water and, and roll away anyway. If we do have a, a dedicated sidewalk user and I hear what Rob's saying, Sidewalk plow goes through, and then half an hour later, the truck goes through, and you kind of undo all the hard work. So can there be coordination between the sidewalk operator and truck operators so that we kind of have more of a lag time after the sidewalk plow goes through in order to keep that sidewalk clear until the sidewalk plow is ready to go again, and the truck goes first, the sidewalk plow follows afterwards, rather than having this, like, maybe half the day goes by, and especially with the bridge, the Main Street corridor is covered. It's difficult to walk, forces people into the road, or instead, people get into their car because some people have that option and then they end up driving instead of walking. So, the car master plan, um, um, I'll pass it around. I made 10 copies. The plan, I, I even made QR codes. It's really easy to see. QR code for the plan. The podcast is really quick. If you live it, listen to podcasts a little bit quicker than one time speed, it's like less than half an hour. Really incredible. They listen, they do an interview with the author and they talk about the number of people in the community that don't drive. And for a lot of communities, it's like 40% of the people in the community that don't drive a vehicle. Talking about kids, other able bodies, and um, people that don't or choose not to or cannot own a car. And so for those 40% of the people, we're giving a small percentage of the resources back to them. So I, I think, I, I thank you everyone for. Having this discussion, um, I'll, I'll start with Robert. Please take a copy and, and maybe just take a look at it. Sure. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric. Yes. Um, I actually hope that you will support the current level of service. You want to know, I think you mean at large, there are a huge number of people who are elderly and fragile and can't simply can't walk. Um, no sidewalk that I've seen is clear enough in the winter for me to walk downtown. There are places within town where I can, but if you prioritize the sidewalks over the roads, then I can't go anywhere because I can't walk on a partially icy sidewalk, and I can't walk in the road that's not safe, and I can't drive in the road if the road is not clear, and I'm not alone. I think there are a huge number of people in Orono who are I'm not, I'd like to think of myself as neither elderly nor frail, but I am both and getting worse. And for the huge number of people in Orono who fall into that category, not keeping the streets clear so that someone who can drive can drive them to wherever they're going is really unfair. It's taking a huge segment of the population and not allowing them to get out and around. I think that's really important. People who live on the side streets, in many cases, are already functioning at a disadvantage through no fault of public works. But many of the side streets don't have sidewalks at all. So if the street isn't plowed, they have no way to get out. So I strongly urge you to maintain the current level of service. If over the course of the year, you can see some patterns that you could change, when you had time to think about it, then it may be a legitimate discussion again next year. But I don't think it's appropriate to change it now in June without being fully thought through the ramifications. The other thing that we've observed, we've lived here now for 10 years. This will be coming up on our 11th winter. Winters have changed. When we first moved here, there was lots of snow, light fluffy snow. Now it's ice. And we had one, one snowstorm last winter. I think all of the others were either pure ice or a mixture of ice and snow.
but the, the storm in mid-January that put 18 inches on us, that was a snowstorm. The one that preceded that, I think, was a nightmare for most people to clear because even your big plows had trouble with that one. There's no way to avoid prioritizing the streets in that situation. Thank you. Thank you. Could I uh, just respond? Um, thank you for that. And I, I think I agree with everything you're saying. Um, and I, I want to take seriously that suggestion that over the course of this year, maybe we, uh, because we are having such a, I think, a, a passionate discussion about walkability and the sound, what it means in relationship to our winter service levels. Um, yeah, I, I think if there's some way that we can, some, some, some sort of system, as Parika is suggesting, suggesting, um, for keeping that in mind over the course of this winter and having a, maybe some check-in um, after the winter, this coming winter is over, or maybe throughout the winter discussing sort of what we're seeing um, and what we might be able to recommend um, around this question. Mm -hmm. I think that seems worth a discussion worth having. <clears throat> I, I do think the fact that we obviously mm -hmm. never want to get in a situation of letting people go. And I, I, so I think it's a factor that, that these are empty positions now. And I, I, the time, I think the time to do it would be now because again, I, I, we've never been in that position and we don't want to be in that, in that position. I also think it's important to keep in mind that we're not talking about not keeping our streets clean. Uh, we're talking about a slower service, but I, again, I, and we, even if we did it different and, and, that's not changing from a safety perspective. It, if I understood what Sophie was just saying, I guess before we had eight people just come in and jump in the rigs and go and must have, we must have done sidewalks at the same time or we had more plows or something. I, I, I don't know how that all went down. Back then, sidewalks were done. Everyone went home. So you would plow, 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 plow till the end of the storm. So it, was, it wouldn't be uncommon for somebody to work a 20, 25, even 30 hour shift. Then everyone would just go home. And it would just be me left. <laughs> and, and then we would do the sidewalks the next morning at seven. Oh, okay. I so we didn't have any resources. So we have more, more plow mm -hmm. trucks. So, I mean, I think um, the narrative that I'm a little bit concerned about is that Orono is not prioritizing walkability because, in comparison to most of the neighboring communities, our sidewalks are done faster. We will do them twice after a storm when the, when things start to fall in. Um, so I, I do think we are prioritizing. You might want to prioritize more, which is council's mm -hmm. choice, but I don't like the narrative of um, we're not because there is some. And Orono has one of the highest per capita alternative transportation modes, but I will let you know that Public transit works. Um, we've got bikes, we've got walkers. Um, the other piece of all of that that we have that many of the communities around us don't have are um, a very high percentage of 18 to 24 year olds who don't have a ton of, ex many of them don't have a ton of experience driving in winter conditions, which is, I think, part of the reason why. We have grown to this, not bare, we are not at a bare place, but at a try to get the roads as clear as we can and as safe as we can, because I think you've got a lot of people driving. And while I applaud and would love to get to a world that um, prioritizes and everybody, if it's only going to be a mile or two, will, will walk, um, I also know that um, in this day and age, we see kids take where public transit is offered to get to the university will take their own vehicle because they want to control it and they don't want to get wet and they don't want to get cold. And they, they, we have conditioned that. And so I understand that we're kind of in that chicken and egg, like, do we stop making it comfortable to do that or, and force change, or do we stop making it comfortable and then have people not in a position to truly manage what they're like they don't change and instead we now have slippery roads for people to 
to navigate when you consider the majority of our population is 18 to 24, or I think it's 60 and older. Which is another great point. We do have the Black Bear Express. If, if it's, you know, stuff is running, then that, we had, that's, I think there, I, I don't know, there is some personal responsibility for going out in the snow, going out in a snowstorm. You go out if you choose to, or some people obviously have to at times, but again, we're not talking about not clearing our roads and not prioritizing our walkability. We're talking about a, a, de a decrease potentially in service, not potentially a decrease in service that I think is worth. I would be similarly. I've I've lived in this town for more than 10 years. And during that time, I've been a person who didn't have a car and biked year round. I've been a person who relied on public transit and I've been a person with a car. And I will say, and I commend that our snow plowing in this town has been excellent as has our sidewalk clearing. And that's been huge. But I really, really appreciate what Eric said, had to say about it being a car's world. And as someone who didn't have a car in this town for two years and relied on public transit and on bikes, that was palpable. And I would love to see us start to shift toward more equity in how we prioritize different modes of public of transit. Um, and so I think for myself, and I'm I'm very I'm not going to die on this hill, but for myself and how I'm feeling about this decision right now, I'd be inclined to not fill these vacant positions, except as the responsibility of council that will take the public flag for that there will be, um, a, you know, a reasonable delay uh, in the excellence of our snow plowing for cars. Um, but for, think about filling one position that's designated toward sidewalks and is really prioritizing that piece of um, non-car modes of transit and and the commitment that I know a lot of our residents have toward um, those so, modes of transit. That's how I'm feeling. I'm thinking we have to give staff some direction. So this yes. falls into a two-tier decision. First, we have to decide whether we are willing to accept a lower level of service, in which case we know we're either going to not fill both of the positions or not fill one of the positions. The second choice, if, if that is the choice of council, then the second choice is, do we not fill both positions and accept that there is going to be a delay in both, a significant delay in both road clearance and sidewalk clearance, or try to fill one with the hope that that mitigates some of the other, some of the parking lot and sidewalk problems later on. So let's let's take that first question first. We need to give staff some guidance. Are we willing to accept the lower service level? I'll say I'm I'm in favor of preserving the service level. That's where I drop out. Accept the lower. lower. I'll accept the lower. I am open to potentially lower, but but I'm I guess I'm just. No, I'm also very excited about the things that Eric was bringing up. Um, and not to create a tangent from what you were just trying to send. Um, but, 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 but not really. Um, I think what's being brought up, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but it sounded to me like from what was being described, regardless of what we do, um, if we were to lower the service level, around the, this general, if we were not to fill these positions, it wouldn't do anything for our ability to be investing in the kind of things that we're talking about around walkability. It would still, in fact, lower in addition to our road service, our sidewalk service. Um, so I don't see it as a, a way to do good on that commitment, despite me being very interested in doing good on that commitment and having more robust conversations about how we have more equity in transportation around uh, biking and walking. I think those things I absolutely want to see because partially that's the life I live. Um, I, I bike and walk all year round. Um, but also I know a lot of people who are in that same boat and I think that that's really important for town. Um, so I am still for keeping this level, not only for the road service, the issues that Rika brought up, 
but also because I don't see it having that significant an impact on our ability to do much good or make much headway toward uh, these issues that I, I see Sonia bringing up that are really valuable um, out of what Eric brought. So all of that is a roundabout way of me saying, I think I'm still for keeping the service level as is. I could be convinced to only fill one position, but I don't wanna see us not fill both. If we fill just the one position, is it possible that that position then really was delegated toward meeting more of these walkability needs? I mean, if we were willing to cut, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm ahead. But I also wanted to ask too, was it not in your original suggestion, Dan, that there be money that was designated to fill a position if needed, like yeah, this I'm wasn't working? Like I remember you that. saying there was money in there somewhere to use you know, if needed, if it wasn't working. Is that right? Yeah. In your right. suggestion? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I like, this is going to continue to come back to it. Right. I mean, I'm for what we need to spend to deliver right. value to, to our community. I just, I don't know. I, I get frustrated because it's so intangible to me. You know, I have no question that the staff is dedicated to doing the best they possibly can with what they have, and they'll do everything they can to be successful with what, what council decides in terms of resources. Um, and if there's a, <clears throat> If this is a yeah but and the but is we need someone in a in a snow plot, in a sidewalk snow blower snow remover machine, I'd be comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> yes. On, on that so, note, can so, I ask, is there I think there was brought up something about is there any thing prohibiting any kind of per diem? Some retired person with a CDL, it's probably a unicorn, doesn't exist, but if if, if it existed. That's what's presenting and preventing you. I, filling a position in the middle of the winter is super hard, and we've tried in the past. It just doesn't. No, but but if 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 there were somebody, whether I don't even need a CDL for a sidewalk plow, obviously, but if there was somebody that was willing to do a per diem, could you do like we do per diems at the library? I think right. Could you do a per so, diem? They would have to be checked out, safety, and all so, that substitutes at the library which is they they're always with a paid they're supposed to be with a paid staffer um the thing about public works is in order to even get in a piece of equipment there is substantial training that they have to undergo um, first and foremost so it's not like i can say yo jeff you've done this before um, jump in this vehicle and go forth and do it. We would get into lots of trouble if we did that. Second piece yeah. is, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the second piece is um, you're setting up this, I'm going to get rid of a full-time person and we're going to try to substitute with per diem. And the thing about per diem is they come when they want you say, here are the shifts I need. So per diem works when you say, here are the shifts that are available for the month. Which ones do you want? And then they say, I'll take these ones. And then you try to hold them accountable to that. Per diem on an on-call basis, that would be um, an incredible uniform. And I also think um, when we look at public works right now, we have lots of benefits because we have a crew that isn't delineating what their positions are, what their jobs are, when they work, how often they get called in, what the break time is. And if anybody who's had any experience with labor unions understands what I just laid out are working conditions. And if we start messing too much with that, we are going to be in a different world of if we mess too much with the working conditions and we start perception of taking away time, taking away resources and expecting more, I am just afraid that we're gonna start getting called on the carpet for the working conditions and not have the flexibility that we have now. And that flexibility is what allows us to work with what for public works in a community of this size is an incredibly small team. I don't know if I've said that in a correct way, but trying to convey a general message. I, wonder if I think you're the last time we used part-time or per diem employees was 
back when we still had sort of had a mowing crew, summer mowing crew. And we ended up with, it was really hard to fill the positions. Um, we ended up with some workers' comp claims out of the deal. Um, you know, I think having somebody like Sophie was describing, I can't tell you when I need you. Yeah. I need you to come in and train. <clears throat> Yeah, I just. I, I wonder if I might hear from Sarah and Sonia on this because we have spent forty minutes on this. We still have to talk about capital infrastructure. Um, I would not support. Um, I think option A, the service level change that would have this trickle trickle down effect on making on delaying plowing that makes our sidewalks accessible. Um, and I assume we'll get to question B in a minute. Right. Yeah. I may not have question A and B still separate in my mind, so correct me if I'm on B instead of A. Um, I guess my question is, I, I mean, I hear what everybody's saying because I hear Leo saying, but these positions aren't filled right now and we really don't want to lay people off. So this is this moment of opportunity. And I really hear we don't want to make a disaster for anybody anywhere around town. I guess I'm just wondering, I thought in Dan's original plan that the suggestion was not to fill the positions, to have a short-term discussion that would be over by September or October with a small subgroup of maybe two counselors and other community members and staff. Could we not like say, okay, we're, we're going to leave in the budget money to fill at least one of these positions and then let this little subcommittee talk between now and the end of September about what to do with that position. Um, I'm just putting that out there as something in the middle, which maybe I could live with. That's me. So I, I like that. I guess my question is when you say what to do with the position, what do you mean by that, Sarah? I don't know. I've heard a lot of different ideas from people about yeah, that. Just, so maybe you know, someone else. We've got a model we operate under now yeah. in terms of. It, it sounds like the sidewalks, I mean, every storm's different and, you know, the different times people come in and <clears throat> it strikes me that it's um, the sidewalks kind of become, have become sequenced third in the response model. You either roads first, parking lot second, and depending on the time of day, which parking lot you have to do, sidewalks third. If we kept, if we had a flexibility to have that, extra position, someone who was really was you know, a sidewalk guru, um, and then, you know, operationalize things in a way that makes sense. You know, it's, it's Rob's gig and, you know, we need to be careful about getting into this, getting into the weeds in terms of, so I'm sorry, in terms of, it doesn't I don't want to in any way question expertise, but at the same time, there's so few areas for us to kind of bend the trend um, in terms of spending. Um, so I think it's an opportunity not to be missed, but so I'd be willing to, but yeah. If you want 24 hour throughout the storm, the sidewalk maintenance, even with just one machine, then you really need two people. Yeah. So that you can stick with the same safety bottle that you can't just have one person do sidewalks for 30 hours. Right. So, so there would still be that necessary 16 hour shift limit, those sorts of things. So I mean that's to me, that's where this whole idea of doing sidewalks before streets is difficult because they you know they have to happen in that sequence. There's no right you have to plow the road, then you have to do the sidewalk because <clears throat> unless you start putting the cell in the middle and some places that's what they do. And if you look in Brewer as an example, they go through and they build these huge. You make big piles in the middle, then a big loader comes the next day with trucks and they and blow it in, and that's resources. We look, we don't have a snowblower on the front of a fan. But I I mean, the, from the sidewalks, I do I, I feel like with there are main streets and there are main sidewalks, and and the most the those are those are most important in my mind. If I have to walk up Mill Street in the road, then I walk up Mill Street in the road because the sidewalk, 
it, it probably doesn't get to the sidewalk. That's how we prioritize that now. Yeah, yeah and, and so like the the main the main sidewalk on that side, it probably doesn't even get get snow from the plow. I'm thinking it's pretty high up over there, like a lot of the main street, maybe right down here. No, everything gets snow. Well, again, I think I think I I'm thinking in terms of the main streets being priorities and the main sidewalks being priorities and public safety and the school parking lot. So I, I guess you're just describing our current. We, we come back to our the That's initial question. Now. Is the majority of council willing to subscribe to some form of service reduction? I say no. It sounds like most people say yes. I'm is asking it, us that, about eliminating two positions or one. I'm asking you, are you willing to entertain a service level reduction? And then we can decide. Okay, what. I'm willing to entertain it. I think I'm willing to entertain yeah. it. I actually, I'm, I'm grateful, Sarah, that you reminded me yes. of the, the sort of level of plan that was in what Dan shared with us, because I like the idea of entertaining a level of service reduction, but with some guardrails, because I don't want to, um, you know, get into a situation where we sort of ruthlessly um, without doing due diligence, cut from the budget what may end up being like a really valuable resource that people are going to value in the community. So I love the idea of maybe not filling the positions right away, putting some more thought into what's the best way to utilize those resources that will best, um, you know, supply the service level that the community really wants. And if that's two full-time people who trade off on sidewalks, I'd think about that. If that's uh, and uh, across the board, we'll want tax cuts in the future and service level reduction. I'd entertain that, but if it's one person, I'd entertain that. But I kind of, so, I'm appreciating Dan's plan, being reminded of it. So, suggest let's be yeah. careful. I don't understand that uh -huh. this is council's meeting, yeah. but we've been sitting here for two hours. Is it possible for us to take a five? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Right. I love that. Thank you. Oh. It's true. It's not a binary. Every storm's different. Every. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
so maybe transition connecting force disagree to that happen. Yeah. Street blocks were only and even then it's going to take time. Yeah. We're only talking about yeah. kickback. Yeah. And what do you think we should do? Oh, well, I think it's like made Oh, I would say I don't want to increase it. Yeah, but it's sat for a long time. So if you notice, it's much deeper on the way we allocate resources. We're sending a lot of resources to do kind of fancy recreation and sacrificing something like this. I think we need to focus on these things first. Yeah. But now it's going to be more. Okay, well, I want to thank Sophie for her suggestion to take a break because I was getting a tremendous amount of tunnel vision there, and uh, I really appreciate stretching my legs. Um, you know, a number of people during the break mentioned to me, you know, ultimately we are here to establish a, a number in the budget that supports a service level that we can live with. We're not here to talk about operations. We're not here to talk about uh, uh, more extended community conversation. I, I think that's, I think we should have a more extended community conversation about this, but that's not tonight's job. So um, if we are comfortable, okay, let, let me say this again. Um, we have to decide whether these two positions are going to remain in the budget or not is ultimately our, our job. Um, so I'd like to take a kind of a straw poll. And without talking about the, sure. the, the operational plan behind that straw poll, what is, what is our desire as a council to fund in this budget? I'm willing to take the two. Okay. Two. Thank you. Okay. I'm as well. I'd like to keep both. I would like to keep both. I'm um, willing to take one out. I'm definitely willing to take one out, possibly two. Okay. So um, then what is our, in a perfect scenario, um, we would like roads plowed in a reasonable time, understanding that if we take one or both of those positions out, that leads to about an hour longer in road plowing. If we take only one of those positions out, there may be some of that time recouped on sidewalks and stuff, depending on how Rob and his staff can schedule it. So is that is that sort of medium period where we only remove one of these positions from the budget, does that save us enough to, to keep it? For the sake of argument, it was an hour difference from removing the two positions. Can we play that through and assume that and I get it's going to depend if it hits there or here, but I mean, for the sake of discussion, shouldn't it be an hour, an hour later? I guess all the way around. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think yeah, but I don't want to. I don't want to speak for Rob, and I really don't think it's. It's not tonight. Probably not exact science. Yeah. Either. So and I get that. Yeah, it's it really is. Our our only job is to say, this is our goal. Rob, can you come back? to us with the price of this goal. So if our goal is to have the roads plowed an hour later and keep in mind that we would like to prioritize sidewalks, could you, I, I guess what I'm, I'm at, okay. So maybe you've given us the, the answer. I'm not trying to put you on the spot anymore. Said, so, okay, so we, we have a council that seems like we'd like to keep the service level as close to where it is as possible, but there's some desire to cut positions. So if we cut one of those positions, we know it's gonna reduce the road service level totally, and it will also reduce the sidewalk service level to an extent. Correct. Okay. Have I mischaracterized what council wants of Rob then? I like Dan's original plan, which was, you had suggested eliminating two, but putting funding in the budget to replace one after in September, or October, correct? Yeah, I, yeah. But I'm hearing frustration and like, you know, we're going to be able to pull this off in terms of ultimately, you know, it's for me, it's a, it's, it's a trying to maybe do too much, go too far to try and you know find middle ground for everybody, and you know, I'll I'll die on that sword. <laughs> yeah. Um, try trying to help. 
everyone get to a position where we could all, but if we're not going to get there, um, I do think you know, there's some fundamental questions about the trends and, you know, spending trends and things like that we have in, in, in Orono and, and what we're spending money on and, and the you know, growth. And I understand the reasons behind it. And we just have to determine from a, as elected officials, if, if we're comfortable with that trend and, and what this budget presents to us. And I do want to have longer term conversations about how we prioritize things and bring back true value assessments from the community. Cause I don't, and you know, we have very few people participating in these sessions um, and we hear different opinions from a couple different people. So, you know, it's hard to say, um, I don't feel like I have enough to know what this community's true sense is. I know I love it when I go out and this roads are clear. So. Yeah, me either. So I really like the community part. Can, so I don't think it's unimportant. Yeah, yeah. Can I just add that we've already cut one position in this budget. We are one position less than we were this year. Which position? IT. So we've cut that. The second thing is over the last two years, we have filled somewhere in the neighborhood of five, six public works positions. Four. Four. I'm thinking WPCF too. Four public works positions. From my perspective, I hear a desire to look ahead and say, this is where we want to get to. I do think while incredibly um, plugged in and um, thoughtful council counselors, even I can't replicate what Rob and his team knows about the roads. And I just wonder if it would make sense. We know where we have turnover more so now than in the past. The workforce is shifting and changing. Rob and I suggested to council five years ago that you put pinpoint in time and say, this is where we want our budget to be and give us the time to put a plan together to capture attrition as it comes through and look at what the priorities are. It sounds like you really want to engage the community to develop priorities across the board. I mean, I don't think you can do public safety, public works without doing the library, parks and rec, and others, right? So the only thing I'm afraid of here is that the vision in June for what the service level will be and the resources that you're giving us to meet that service level are not going to match. And um, we can get to, uh, this, it won't even be December, it will be January or February when we you get feedback from people that it's not working, if it's not gonna work. And at that point, hiring somebody doesn't really help. It's unusual for us to be able to hire somebody that will go directly into a truck or even a sidewalk machine. Working at the beginning of the, of the year when you can still see landmarks and work things, things through is an important piece of operating that equipment. Um, and um, the, the idea that there's a contractor out there, there are a few contractors, but by that time of the year, they have staffed for, we would be negotiating even before now for a winter, even assistance contract, even like what we do over at the UC. So I think, um, I think it's important to kind of just, I guess, take that gut check and understand cutting people and asking, cutting 20% of the resource and asking for better sidewalks does not make sense. I don't know how you manage to do that in Maine with the way our infrastructure is. Um, ultimately, it's your choice. And I think the other piece that usually has gotten a lot of conversation that I haven't heard a lot of tonight, um, you can skip over it if you want to, but in the past has been a great interest to council that one of the things Rob is saying without coming right out and saying it is with redu reduced resources, he is not going to be able, he's not going to have the ability to prioritize that seven o'clock school start the way he does now as an absolute. 
So is there a way to make it so that does get prioritized? I, I'm, I guess, again, it, it, this does depend on when the snow flies, doesn't it? I, Am I missing something? I, I, I guess the only thing we can guarantee is that right now that we are staffed to do it, and if we make cuts, we may be staffed to do it, but there may be times when we're not. So now we can almost guarantee it, you know, unless we have a really bad storm and there's a snow day, if we make a staffing change, We'll have more snow days. So I think the idea, if we had additional resources and it was easy to meet the seven o'clock cutoff on a routine basis and it was out of the norm for it to be difficult, um, then I could probably not have the concern I have. Um, but right now, when I have my public works director come in and say, yep, I found the rabbit to pull out of the hat because I didn't think we were gonna make, make it to the school, that, you know, again, where there's a lot of stuff going on and I don't think council necessarily sees it all that's happening. But I guess we'll, we're getting probably again yeah. into, into the Back in the All right, so your question really is, can we accept the one hour delay? One hour delay on the plowing, one hour delay on the sidewalks, do we think as a council we can accept it? Yeah, I don't know. savings of yeah. 300. It's a lot of money, right? Yep. It's quite a lot of money. How much, Leo? Hundred thousand dollars operating each each year, yeah. every year, and then a, a truck until we have to get a truck. Okay. It's it's not insignificant. Okay. Like I could try it. I mean, I don't think it's ideal, but I really also feel like this conversation could go on endlessly. So I guess yeah. I'm just going to yeah. say I think I could try it. I liked the idea of having some money that was in a contingency fund. But if that's really useless to you, I was hoping that could be used by September or October, not in the middle of January. So personally, I'd rather put the contingency fund thing in there for one position back if needed. But I think I could live with it. And I think I'm ready to move off this conversation personally. I think I could get on board with what Sarah just said. I think I'm with the same mind. I really do find interesting what you brought up. Thank you, Dan. And I, I would be interested in that. It sounds like the timeline also wouldn't really make sense from staff's perspective. Um, I'm, you know, and I, I know I've been one of the people saying I really don't want to cut um, on this line, but I, I, I could find acceptable as a compromise here, cutting one position and only staffing one. Okay, so, so why is only, only staffing one puts us an hour behind, losing two puts us an hour behind, so I'm not sure why we would only staff for one. Is if, it not I'm, true that that person could potentially swing shift if needed? I mean, the extra person would reduce hope. the impact on the sidewalk clearing. Yeah. Sidewalk. Okay. There we go. That sounds worthwhile to me. Okay. Is that what you said? Uh, what? Is that what you had just said? I said I could leave with the two if we need to live with the two, but if we're settling on one, I can do that I mean, too. I'm just really ready. We're good. To if you wanted to, you know, I was offering my make a choice. Billing is a compromise. Sort of two with one because there's contingency money to put one back in, as I understood it, by the end of September or early October. So it's it two, like but potentially one, depending on the conversation. Yeah. That's what so I understood. And end the Okay. So, Dan? Yep. Two. 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 Are we still putting the contingency in so we can't add well, we have, we have capital. We have reserves. We yeah. do have so reserves. reserves we can use. Scott, then I can live I with you. I think that's what your okay. thing said. So we have reserves. Uh, what, uh, we're going to get into capital yeah, uh, from. Wasn't it listed in? I, I don't have a real <laughs> view of all the reserves, but I think we probably have fifty thousand dollars in reserve somewhere now. Yeah, well, there's in, in one of our reserves accounts that. Uh, so we have a winter maintenance reserve. Not that one. We have unintended. What do we have? It's the unintended. It's the unassigned reserve. Unrestricted. Unrestricted reserve. So, I mean, you do it you want, but. If instead of taking you're going to tell me no, but yeah, well, no, I'm, I get saying, it. Oh, yeah. I'm not saying no to how you want to use yeah. the fund balance, but in this particular circumstance, if you're concerned and you want to have contingency, would it maybe make sense to um, put however, whatever the savings is for? I can't, I still don't understand if you're taking two or one, but whatever that savings is, and then pull the, continue, create whatever's left in that savings might to get to your 100,000, just like we did with the police cruiser, where you said, we're only gonna spend 60, but we'll put the other, but we wanna make an $85,000 contribution. And, you know, uh, 
appropriation into total for police cruisers, spend your 59 and put the rest into mm-hmm. a, a reserve account, which is what your current capital says. Mm-hmm. So I guess my question is, if you're looking at um, cutting one with a contingency to put it back or cutting two with a contingency to put one or two back, why couldn't we do it the same way? So we're still drawing the tax rate so that next year, if we decide it needs to go back in, it's not a spike. It's simply reallocating. I think that was Dan's idea. I think that's it. That's a smart idea. This was from unassigned fund balance. The challenge is it doesn't do anything the way you just described it, as I understand it. And please, if I'm wrong, it strikes me that it wouldn't do anything for our tax liability. So what it does is... Um, it decreases the operation. The contingency is there because you're not 100% sure whether or not that's going to work. So what you're doing is you're keeping the position unfilled. If you're going to fill it and you're going to use that contingency, Mm -hmm. it's going to be part of the tax rate next year. So instead of doing this, you do this and collect your savings next year. So for that, in terms of the $325,000 in savings that was in that pack that you gave us, does it amount, does that carry down to what the the tax assessment is for this year, for 24? So I don't, I still haven't wrapped my head around whether you're talking about two positions in contingency for one, one position contingent. So talk about two and are you going to put two back in or one back in? Potentially one. Okay, so well, no, well, I, yeah, I, yeah. See, this is challenge. I mean, I, I'd hoped for, I'd hoped for, you know, the option to be able to have a conversation and, and, and figure and, this out together, and, and then have some resources. To the extent we, if we identified, we, you know, we brought in some folks, you know, from the bicycle community, the school community, the mm-hmm. health association, and brought people and had a conversation. So you got to absolutely have that person who comes in at four in the morning, gets in a snowplow. It's in a sidewalk snow plower and works from four until you know noon every day to make sure that, you know that kind of stuff. I thought that would be a good use of resources for if that was the kind of solution we came down to. But if we're not going to be able to come down to that, we, and in, in a way that's operational for you, Rob, in terms of you know if we decide that at the end of the September, so, it's not time to hire somebody. My my concern is that regardless of how you do this, we hmm. see a decrease, right? Because we wouldn't buy the truck if we're in the middle of a flight. Oh pilot, right? So um, one of the things that I have seen in the budget from before I got here to now is you take something out, you see a savings and you bounce back up because people don't like what you try. Trying is not a bad thing. It's not. But If we're back here next year having to fight to put another body in a budget with a council that is absolutely opposed to adding bodies to the staff, um, that is a, I mean, you're going to spike the the tax rate. And you, you know, I don't know if there's a number that has been floated by council as to what the, the target is to save, but you're saving quite a bit of money. Um, and I just, I'm, I'm having a hard time based on the discussions that we've had here about trends and, and adding people and adding money. And when I see that a lot of those have come as a bounce, and it would seem to me that if your goal is to mean to get a draw where you're comfortable and maintain it so that there isn't those wide swings, um, that holding that money off to the side. The other thing that I always get really nervous about is looking at unassigned fund balance like a bank account, like Mm -hmm. a savings account, Um, because we have $34 million worth of assets that we are charged with maintaining. And that money would disappear very quickly if we ended up with a micro storm like Brownville had or some of the other issues that have hit. So I just... I see a way to get you some of your savings now, a path to be able to give you the opportunity to talk about what you want, to talk about with the community, and and not have that bounce if what you're thinking today isn't what the community ultimately wants. Do we have a million dollars in the TIF 
reserves altogether, roughly. Is that right? Um, this, this, this is yeah, it'll be about nine hundred thousand, I think. Um, because that's and, the and can, can tip reserves be put towards cleaning streets down downtown streets? We have a really hard time um, doing that unless it was. Uh, Yeah, we could buy equipment with it. If we had a, for a long time, we had a, like a contra, a special season, you know, like it was Marlene, Marlene that did downtown like cleanup. We we charged that out to the to the district, which would be similar to the TIF district. But if we but, theoretically had someone come in and focus on keeping all of this downtown district clean, have that now. I, I'm. Um, I guess my point is, is there 30 grand in that reserve fund that we could set it, that we, it, it's there. We use it if we need to. I'm trying to understand. You can only use those funds in the district. Only sure. in the district. And that's the only that place we'll have it, right in the district. But we don't, we don't have a position that's, 92% town, 8%. And if we squint, yes, it seems like we've squinted at times on, right. on how we use that, but maybe so I'm off. Is, our, okay. is the consensus of council that we're going to reduce two positions and build in a contingency for one? Or is it reduce two and build a contingency for two? Or a half, because it wouldn't happen until September. But well, I, I think we have to build in either one position mm -hmm. or two. I'm comfortable with reducing two and building a contingency for one. Yeah. I'd rather clear? have it come off the tax and come out of the assessment. So that, I mean, if we have to come back next year and say, whoops, we need, absolutely need two people back, then we have to, you know, that, then that's the accountability that we have to be able to expect. Okay. Okay. Sophie, is that enough direction for you? No, so I don't quite understand, Dan, what you're saying is you would prefer, where do you want the contingency coming from? I would, the you know, assigned balance if we have to use it. No. I think that's our, if that ends up, it's going to end up being our only ask out of that account, other than the $300,000. Okay. All right. Thank you for that discussion. Um, no, I, no, I, I did not mean that to sound. No, I know you're not inspired. That's great. That's great. Um, okay. We do have another uh, substitute part, significant part of public work budget to talk about, right? And I uh, want to move through that. Um, that has to do with our capital, right? Yeah. So. So. Appreciate everybody sitting in on such a long meeting with us. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So um, we have it. Did not ask uh, Rob or Sophie to prepare a presentation on any of this material. We said we'd go through it on our own and approach them with questions. So if there are questions that we have or savings that we want to entertain regarding the um capital funds for public work. No. <clears throat> Two questions. Yes, Leo. Can I, can I oh, yes. just can I just um move on? I yeah. just need two seconds with Rob. Okay. Sure. Sure. So we can only find this part. So Oh, you can talk. That's on you. Very, very small chair. It's, yeah, it's, I gotta stop trying to. One hundred percent.
Thanks for good TV. Steve, you have a watching us with the This is gonna this is gonna end, right? Yeah, see if they can make payments there. Yeah, the five percent is a little easier to take when you get it. Okay. Oh, yeah. We could do that instead, and that would be All right. Signal back, but it wouldn't spike again. Sophie, are you ready? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. It's a thought. Uh, you know, you had a question. Uh, yep. Just um, on the public works facility reserve, is there a target in mind for that? It looks like we're putting ten grand in, and we have an eighty grand reserve set up in there. Is there? Is that? Or something that's like targeted, like we want to have X in here just to keep this thing going, or what? What is that? The public works facility. Yeah, yeah. So we know that. So the new construction came online in 2015. We know that 20 years from 2015, we have to do air handlers. That's going to cost fifty thousand dollars, or heat pump, fifty thousand dollars, or. 30 years we're going to need to do a roof that's going to cost a hundred thousand or maybe parking water, all those sorts of things. So it's there's really not necessarily target for what we need in there, but I know that in that 15 to 25 year period, so um, you know, 2030 to 2035, you know, 2040, there's gonna be some very significant expenses needed keep that building operating. So it made sense to create a reserve to help pay for some of that stuff so that yeah. we wouldn't have to come up with all of those funds. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I'm, I'm just wondering if there's like a, a number there where we feel good that we some bank that's gonna help target. Yeah, it's, it's $150,000 just to pay for parking lot. Which page are you on? Um, I just, I'm, Okay. The chart Looking that she that gave step. us yeah. okay. just Thank you. to see what we have in reserves to try to mm -hmm. compare it with what we're putting in there. Um, and same, this, I do have the same question with the um, capital equipment reserves. I think we've got 330 and we're putting 75 a year in there. Is that that's just is that for when some piece of capital equipment comes up that we don't know of, or just a pay down future one? How do we how do we, so do we have we, a target and are we yeah, so we use that for a couple of things. Like, for example, when the ladder on the ladder track broke and it was a $50,000 repair, we took it out of that. So it allows us to not have to budget to the extreme and the repair lines. We used to use it to help pay down. That's how we used to pay Rob's. Rob would we put money in. It was used when I first got here only for Rob's um, trucks to help with the spikes. Um, the problem is that uh, we used and used and used. And when you're putting 7,500 or we started at 100 and then it got dropped to 75 for the taxes, when you're putting 75 in and taking 185 out, you eat it very quickly. When you look at the number of vehicles we have and the amount of equipment that we have, the goal would be to be able to build that up. So as part of our long-term capital plan, we would have a single consistent draw on taxes and be able to use that for maintenance, you know, like the big repairs that we know are coming, and also to um, take some out to make sure that we have a, an even draw is I think the intent when that first started. The problem is that we use so much of it and there isn't a way to put money back into it. How high has it been? When I first got here, I want to say it was in the 800s. And we're just building it back up. Am I remembering right that for capital equipment, you were suggesting eventually we might want to be thinking 400 to 500 per year? That's what Is I'm that, what thinking. Really thinking? Yeah. But as we've gone through this process, because believe it or not, I actually pay attention to what you guys say. 
Um, I really think the thing to do is to move ahead. Um, at this point, you've kept the asset management software in, which will be a big help to Rob as we plan for the fleet. Mm -hmm. I think we should be looking at the 20 year plan and coming up with how much we should be putting into reserves each year, how much we, what yeah. the cycle is for each thing um, with an escalator in it because costs continue to go up. Okay, thank you. Exactly a question, Jeff, but I did have a suggestion kind of that connects to our previous discussion. I was I agree with Sophie about not wanting tax rates to spike if we're adding the position back in. So I was wondering about keeping the contingency fund for the plowing person coming out of the general tax revenue and instead having some facilities expense come out of the unrestricted funds, that these would be much more one-time expenses that wouldn't keep recurring. Mm -hmm. So my, I'm just looking at numbers. My suggestion is maybe the data and tech systems out of the unrestricted funds, that's 125. And then we could keep the hundred that's for the position still coming out of the tax draw so that it wouldn't create a tax spike if we added that back in. Mm -hmm. How do people feel about Sophia, that? Sophia, what does that do to your to your long-term planning of that. So, I mean, I think sense to me. we end up in this place every every year where we look at capital and we say it's a one-time expense. And you're right, we're only well, gonna do that once, position. right? Yeah, not that it's- the, yeah. the issue that we have is that it's not, we're just gonna, we're gonna buy these things only for one year. Sure. And so when, for example, last year, we dropped the equipment cost from the tax rate down to like $47,000. And this year, large chunk of the $600,000 increase is getting us back where we were. I wonder instead of, because there is kind of, if you're looking that we're starting to get to over the next five years, a pretty stable amount. We also know that there are lots of things that we're assessing right now that are going to have larger costs. So I just wonder if it would make more sense to look at if you want to hit fund balance for a big one-time project, I would do it as a catch-up project as opposed to fund what we know will be an annual expense of it's X number of dollars every year to maintain our buildings. It's X sure. number of dollars every year to maintain our sure. fleet. Right. Yeah. Really? That makes sense to me down the line. I just feel like we haven't been there yet. And so in a way, these really are kept up expenses because we haven't, I mean, like painting the cock, for example, the, the Keith Anderson building is a catch up expense. These are catch up expenses largely, a lot of them, aren't they? So if you look at the capital plan until you get to 2028, 20, where Rob is saying, I can't put anything for facilities in 2028 because I'm waiting for so many assessments and what reports. Right. Right. There are tons of unknowns. Right. But if you look across the general tax draw, it's pretty even. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. take this out now, okay. you're going to have a spike. And if your goal I is see. to have... I see. So this would create the same spice, is what I you're saying, because you've already so. put it right. Okay. I think then so. it's not useful. Thanks, Sophie. I just wanted to suggest it because I think that was an important concern you brought up. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And I do think that we have substantial, just like we went out and borrowed the $2 million on you know, to do the catch up work for public works that now gets us to a flat draw on the taxes, um, there is substantial work that we're going to have to invest um, in our facilities. We know that. Yeah. I would rather not bond for it. Yeah. I don't have any other questions on this section. I thought it was like incredibly well organized and presented. So I'm just gonna say, I don't have any more. I don't either. Actually, the same mind. And not just because I'm tired. Yeah. Oh, this goes a little faster at the end, though. Yeah. Yeah. yeah good ordering of. Uh, no, this was really organized. No, I, I thought it was. Real. Any questions yeah. on this? Any other? Mine. Okay. Any other public comment on now we're talking about uh, capital improvement facilities? Okay. So I don't. See that there's any desire for any modification of this section, Sophie. Yeah. 
Okay, so what else do you need from us to deliver a budget? So I need two more things from you, and I'm sorry, it's almost eight o'clock. No, it's fine. Right. I'm going to move us through, and I will just tell you, short math tells me that um, the changes that we've made tonight um, drop the um, total operating expenses to Twelve million one sixty nine five sixty five, which is an increase of seven hundred thirteen dollars and eleven hundred seven hundred thirteen thousand one hundred eleven dollars, six point two percent. So you're right on inflation, um, and um, capital is at two million one two million one hundred sixty thousand six hundred and eighty. Which is an increase of three hundred seventy-eight thousand twenty-five dollars, and uh, that is twenty-one point twenty-one. Total increase is eight point two four. We're down four hundred nineteen thousand six dollars in the municipal assessment. Um, which is three cents on the mill rate um, increase projected. Now, understand that I have captured what I think is gonna be the real property growth. The mill rate that we publish is likely not gonna be the mill rate that comes out because we are doing um, an assessment adjustment, but you've got to be able to see what that will really mean in people's pockets. Because when the value goes up, the mill rate goes down, it equalizes. Um, you send it, you'll send us that latest yep, update. I will send you that. I'm going to take some time with Rob tomorrow to go through and double check. Um, my So I just want to make sure I understand. What you want in contingency is an allocation from fund balance of $100,000. $100, yep. Okay. A hundred. That's for two positions, right? It's one. No. Sixty. 66 will get you. So you want two, 100. I mean, 100 is a round number, like at my desk at home, right? I'm not, okay. I didn't have the benefit of, but I'm so one position. Okay, whatever one Let's position go one. is. So I'm going to do 65 to round it out. Um, and you will see that allocation not as part of the budget. You will see that allocation when you do your A3. So that is, you do it the same time. I'm going to have you, I'm going to ask you to approve at the same time that you approve the, um, the budget that same day. But we're, that's when you make the allocation of what you want mm -hmm. in reserves for the fund. So the other thing I need is um, we had, I think Dan had spoken about uh, I think the only thing that Dan spoke to that we haven't done is the um, delivery. So dropping the library, interlibrary loan from um, five days a week to four days a week. So to understand, I just wanna make sure everybody understands kind of what that means. Um, four days a week service would, one would be funded by Orono, three would be funded by other sources. Um, one of those sources is Penobscot County, which allocates its funding um, in a calendar year because that's their budget as opposed to a fiscal year. I don't have any reason to believe that they'll drop it, but if they did, that would um, be. And the, um, the other thing that happens is so there, when we look at impact, we process approximately. 20 pieces of interlibrary loan a year, 20,000 pieces of interlibrary loan a year in and out. Um, if those are coming in less days, that it might mean that with resources, we're going to lengthen the time. Everybody will still get their cards. So I wanted to just make sure everybody was in, in agreement that was something they wanted. It's the only one I know. I had on a list, but no disposition. How much does that save? Yeah. It, like it only saves $1,400. Yeah. I think I'm inclined to keep 
uh, you know, being good partners in our interlibrary loan system and keep that in the budget, unless anyone else feels strongly that that's worth the savings. I agree with you, Sonia. I feel particularly bad that Lori's been here for three hours. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, the insight it's about it's like about seven days a week. Like, <laughs> and it looks like Padrica I'll do a hand <laughs> so we're not going to worry about the. We're not going to worry. All right, thank you. Did you okay. want to chime in on that? And I was just going to say, but I did the calculation. It would save you one quarter of one cent. Yeah, on the mill rate. It doesn't really sense. doesn't show up. Yeah. It doesn't really it doesn't show make up. any sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so and what it would do in part when you're talking, it's actually twenty two thousand last year. And that would, since a lot of times it's volunteers who are checking those in and out. It would really foul up the schedule for the volunteers to keep those books moving. That's that's a huge volume, and asking volunteers to change their lives in order to accommodate a change in schedule to take one quarter, one cent off the mill rate, hoping that you will support yeah. not doing that. Well said. Thanks for your insight. I I approve Frederica's plan for doing the that. service. <laughs> so. Yeah. The other thing I need um, is to switch. We have an election coming up. And <laughs> so the next thing I need from you is I create. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I had one more on uh, Dan's sort of, sort of list of things. One is a proposed spending increase, which would be a possible sort of or no for everyone grant program opportunity. And I thought that was worth um, worth thinking about. It's another. Uh, you know, might be a, a penny on our mill rate and could be a nice. I'm curious what other folks thought. I liked that idea. It's 10,000. 10,000, mm -hmm. yes. On the council line, right? Isn't yeah. The, the same thing line. we talked about early yep. on about putting a new initiatives kind of grant so people could mm -hmm. have a new idea to get yep. funded for something that was a one year thing only. Yeah. Kind maybe of idea. Like an arch project around right. the ice yeah. rink is kind of a right. nice way to kind of offset it. But yeah, I like this idea. I would in favor of adding this. So can I? It's an annual expense. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it is not the plus 10 that you are as well. It, I mean, is, is it or is it? It is the same one. I think it's right? the same one. It's the same one. Is that, is that money in the budget or? No, I haven't put it there. I just okay. want to make sure because that was, I had. Okay. So we don't have any protocols around the development or this development of this program, disbursement of this fund. This is just putting it in the budget as a yeah. place. Yeah. yeah. And other councils have done that. And remember, not that we want to do a lot of it. But you can put money in there that you ultimately might decide that you don't use, you're not ready to use next year, mm -hmm. and it lapses to fund balance. As long That's as, okay, we're not so obligated to spend it. No. And I have, just so you are aware, I've told Rob you can go because it's getting late. Yeah. But thank, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. So what I need, um, I do a presentation of the budget. It talks about what services we're providing, changes to service level that this budget represents. Um, we have in the past, if it is big, we've talked about things that were in the budget and came out of the budget. So I think there are some things in here we wanna talk about. Um, and depending on what I see out there, I usually find some good charts graphs to talk about the impact and what the value is um, for the tax. Mm -hmm. This is not something in the past I have run through council. Council shows up and sees it the same day it is delivered. And quite frankly, many days, it might just be being finalized 10 minutes before the meeting. Um, so I saw a suggestion that we get a PowerPoint out by Thursday. If that's a necessary thing, I don't know that that's something I can do with my current schedule. So um, we have to, that's a council desire. I think we'd have to talk about what what I would need to not do. Um, but are there particular highlights that council wants me to hit? I don't, at this moment in time, I'm not even looking for a point list. If people have ideas, I'll probably come back to them. But are there specific highlights that you think beyond what I've already talked about need to be hit from this part? The ones you said. The services, the budget funds. Mm -hmm. We always spend some time talking about the separate, um, what the tax bill funds that mm -hmm. the council only has control over municipal, mm -hmm. yeah. but the services we fund um, made major changes, increases, right. decreases, 
service level impact. Yeah. yeah. And then we talk about impact to the pocketbook and the value that you that you're getting. So what you're spending. So one of the things we've seen that will be new this year is an allocation for how much you're spending for um, public safety, how much you're spending on a on an average tax bill. So. so the only thing that's been really helpful for me in the past is when you can break it down in graphs and pictures. I'm really appreciate the visual, the pie chart kind of thing. I think what you just articulated in terms of a high level of review sounds great to me and sort of the resource the community is probably uh, knows and, and expects. Yeah, that too, and I like the idea of like Thursday is a week ago, Thursday seemed like a pretty good idea. And you know, it's Monday at eight, eight o'clock, it doesn't. Um, so I, I throw this out too for Sophie, for you, but for anyone, it's just, you know, some this, these kickoff discussions sometimes would be, please don't think because they don't always have time to come into an office or and we get together so infrequently. So please, they're, you know, oftentimes they're just a starter. For me. You know, it's kind of my own. So to the extent it's helpful, great. To the extent we need to talk about it. I would like to see something. I'd love to see the PowerPoint posted as something with the budget materials so that people who don't get a chance to watch the whole video would be able to see it. I think that'd be helpful because there's so much content rich and important content but because powerpoint's kind of tricky though because not everyone has powerpoint right i don't know pdf More, it though PDF. So we, PDF yeah. it. PDF. we pdf that the other thing we can do is clip the um public hearing and put the video yeah. the link to the video so question in terms of things i would love something that showed people some change over time not just this budget compared to last year, because what you were saying about people then going, wait, why did it spike? It makes it obvious if they can see it came down the previous year and then it went up. So I don't know if anybody else feels like that, but I would love, like this is one that came from a school in another area, but I don't know. I'd like something that shows not just this budget compared to last year, but also a little bit of data about what the budget has done over the last five years or 10 years or something like that. Because otherwise I think there's too much hyper-focus on little blips and not like how it plays out. That's me. Um, that was just one idea, but yep. is um, anybody else interested in that? Maybe he'll make us yeah, copies so people could see it. Fine. Yeah, sure. So last thing I'm gonna just suggest, and it's not a me thing, so you can disregard it if you don't like it, but I've heard a lot of conversation during the budget process about wanting the community to get engaged mm -hmm. and wanting to get feedback and frustration that we hold a public hearing or workshops and we have our faithful two that show up. I, I think you're suggesting a lot of change in this budget that um, it might be worth it to get a very short message from council. And I wonder if you might take our communications expert and our chair to work with me um, to craft a very brief message that we could put on Facebook and out through to invite people to come to the public hearing on Monday, um, social media, but then have you pick it up and you amplify it and ask your friends to amplify it and move it through the process that I, um, from, and I've said this many times, but I want to be very clear. It's not what the service level is. It's to make sure we're resourced to it. And if you're resourcing us to the service level, I think the next step is telling people what that looks like and getting feedback from them, positive and, and negative. So when we come back on the 20th, we have um, actual comments to consider. Um, not really sensible. Does that sound yeah. good? You know, that sounds great. That was my next thing was to say, like, this is really our chance to get people to show up and tell us, do you like this idea or do you not, right? So if I, I, I will say, I talked to Dan earlier to make sure I wasn't following, well, telling well, him. Telling, 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 telling. Um, so, and he was, he was happy to do that. I do think getting it out sooner rather than later will be important yeah. because it takes time for that to build. Yep. Um, and I also wonder if it would make sense to put a budget comment um, on website for people who just submit their comment if they can't come. That's a great idea. And idea. Some of it, yep. some people will submit comments that have no. It's like good people stuff is obviously irrelevant because it's a school one, but. So um, 
that's my suggestion uh, so for that. And then um, I had another suggestion and I lost. So clearly, um, oh, that if we're going to hopefully have lots of comments at the budget meeting, I had initially penciled in an invitation to invite Orono VZ Water District folks to the 20th. I would think that we would want to put things on the agenda that we could more easily bump and not have guests be just in case yeah. there is a lot of comment mm -hmm. um, and would bump would see if we could bump them to July, which mm -hmm. would be um, probably not going to do it on the third. I'm going to guess you're probably not going to want to have a meeting on the third, yeah. but we could do it the next week after the council meeting if that works. I can issue more. Great. Sounds good. Thanks for reminding us about the rest of the process. And I think it's really important that tonight yeah. isn't the end. Like there's yeah. more coming about hearing from people and responding yeah. to that potentially. Does this yeah. mean we don't have to meet on Wednesday? I would say I would say I have my marching orders and and understand when I present the budget, if I've yeah. somehow Come. not done it correctly, then you guys have another bite at the apple. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you all. Let's close the workshop. Thanks. I don't think we've been utilizing. Yeah, I just that side. Might be something.